Do you know, someone in the chat the other day said they came in late and they were very upset that they missed the dancing. The dancing is the best part. So whoever you are that said that, you get me. You and I, we're like this. All right, today is a very special day, as many of you know, because I teased it out. But first, I'm going to tell you the topics. You know Rolo Tomasi's here. You know he's here, but we're not going to go to him yet. we got to save that little candy. Save that candy for a minute. I'm going to tell you the topics first that I want to get to with Rolo. Of course, when Rolo's here, we just let the conversation go where it's going to go. But I have some things I want to ask and some curiosity I have about some things. So I want to talk about the impact of birth control pills on society. He had put up a photo <laughs> that I'm going to bring up because it's been. Yes, you oh, did. Oh, the one that's yeah, Oh, okay. yeah. And we're going to talk about a feminized workplace. What does that mean? Is it happening? What are the implications of that? Parents indoctrinating their kids with some woke hysteria. I want to get his input on a video that came out on MSNBC that I think he's going to get a kick out of. Some predictions about masculinity and femininity for the future. We talked the other day about how both are shrinking in terms of people's perceptions, men's perceptions of how masculine they are, women's perceptions of how feminine they are. What's going to happen in 20, 30, 40, 50 years when it comes to those two words and what those words mean? How much have women really changed in the last three decades? We're going to ask someone who was probably dating three decades ago or around that. Mm, yeah, thereabouts. All right. And we're going to find out. And when we talk about the good old days, there was a fascinating article in the New York Post about Hooters. And so many people were commenting, the good old days, the good old days. What does that really mean when people say that? I want to dig into that. And finally, we're going to get into the matrix because it's up to no good, as you all know. And I want to get Rolo's perception about a little bit of what's going on there. Some tweets, some video to show there. With no further ado, I would like mm. to welcome Mr. Rolo Tomasi. Thank you. You're in person. Thank you. You're in person. Nice I to love be back it. Again. Nice to be back. I love it. Listen, mm. the audience gets very feisty mm. when you're on remote because they feel like it's not the same kind of, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well. It's not. I'll give you a proper intro. The Rational Male. He needs no introduction. Mm. The Rational Male on YouTube, author of the book series, The Rational Male. You're also mm. doing that show called Access Vegas mm -hmm. now. With which my is good friend Mike Sartain. Mike we were just Sartain. doing a live stream. Yes. yes, who's here, who mm -hmm. I just met, who is yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna have to have on at another time you know this show i do like one guest mm -hmm. at a time right now That's and you my have zone. had a good common friend of ours justin waller was i had on justin waller on tonight. he was very very nice very friendly mm -hmm. um yes i've gotten to know some was he very stimulating for you stimulating yes. he was you know he was exactly as i anticipated oh, to be honest really? like i i didn't no surprises very mm -hmm. polite um, how tall are all you of the above I'm not even 5'5". Five five. And he's six foot four. Every, I basically <laughs> look like a small child next to everyone. <laughs> so true. even it's this, true. you know, it was so funny. I had mm. Patrick by David on. I did an interview with him mm. and he came on and the side shot was absurd. It looked like <laughs> I was like a Smurf mm -hmm. and he was a human. It was, it's actually, people should go back and watch that interview and just look at the, the, the side shot we just showed. It's absolutely absurd. Said next to Pat. Okay. So I'm excited to have you here. Obviously, we are in communication sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, every now and then I'll see a DM from you we that's are hysterical. In, not just sometimes. <laughs> right. Like on a weekly and basis. And you'll post yes. stuff that I'm yes. like, that's too funny. You posted something the other day on one of your um, stories, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. It was a packet of a birth control, a birth control oh, pill packet. Oh, that one, yeah. That's and it old, looked though. like, yeah. I know, mm -hmm. but it looked like a woman that was tossing a baby. And mm -hmm. I, the story disappeared. I wanted to pull it for the show. I had to go and search for it. And do you mm -hmm. know what I Google searched, people at home? Woman throwing baby away, birth control pill packet. And it came up. I was going to say, it's probably all kinds of returns. It for came that. up. Mm -hmm. So I want to show the audience. Okay, this is an image that you can see. If you, that, this is a woman who says she painted her birth control packet. And she on the right. <laughs> Whatever she did, I don't know. Who she, knows? She did not do that. Was, I know the illustrator. <laughs> That's it. Now mm. you see this. I don't know that particular brand of birth control pills, but look at this. Now, is there something not, first of all, audience, just absorb that for a second. Something unbelievably distasteful about that image to me. I don't know. Like, it just rubs me wrong in so many ways. See that little baby floating in the sky? <laughs> and it, it kind of, it's like vulgar. Mm -hmm. I, I just, and I took birth control pills. I'll get into that with you in a second. Sure. But... I want to ask you about, this is something I wonder a, a lot, what do you think the impact has been of the introduction of birth control mm -hmm. pills? What has that done? Has it influenced promiscuity among women? What has it done with respect to the delay that happens where women are delaying mm -hmm. the time period when they choose the, to have a family? If you, uh, I don't know if you've read my fourth book, Religion, but I, uh, I go into great detail about uh, hormonal birth control, HBC. Um, HBC is probably the single greatest most destructive 
invention humankind has ever invented. How so? To the, because it has such, I, I, I illustrated as such, is that it is more, it has more, had more of an impact on humanity than atomic weapons. Because atomic weapons does one thing, kills off a bunch of people, mm -hmm. okay? When you're looking at hormonal birth control and you look at the, the uh, series of events that have cascaded since the, the sexual revolution, which came right after hormonal birth control became a big thing, then you see a spike in divorces. And uh, one of the things I'm going to actually talk about with Myron today, uh, later on in Fresh and Fit, is, uh, is divorce. And um, how, like, I, I'm, I constantly kind of butt heads with guys like Hafiz or these people who are like, uh, you know, trad traditional conservatives. And they want to they want to talk about, you know, uh, like how men need to get married and everything and, and uh, how there's, uh, you know, marriage is 50%, you know, 50% divorce rate. And I, I have done, uh, a lot of studies for, I want to say, I'm not going to really make it a book, but I, I might make it a series of blog posts, um, and it's going to be based around 1971. Mm -hmm. And between 1965 and about 1975, you see all of this series, cascade of events that all run back to one thing. That was 1965, which is right when the, uh, the sexual revolution took place and right after hormonal birth control became more widely available. What happened in the wake of that is now you have one sex that is responsible for the reproductive future of the entire race at mm. that time. And so, yes, was it in industrialized countries in the, in the beginning? Yes, it is. Um, but we, we, we tend to look at birth control, uh, abortion, any reproductive rights, which we've been talking about all year long. Um, we look at those in terms of being rights now, whereas before it was we didn't know what we were going to do with, uh, with hormonal birth control because for we solved one of the one of life's greatest mysteries like how do we have sex without having babies mm -hmm. attached to that well the problem with that is in doing so we have essentially signed over uh the reproductive uh control of the human race to one sex whereas before prior to the, uh, the hormonal birth control there was uh, men had an involvement and women had an involvement and there was a compromise that was between the two of them it was a compromise of mating uh, mating strategies and mating interests whereas now uh, I would argue that in 2022 when you look at the uh, what is it the average age of first marriage for women is something like 28 or 29 mm -hmm. if you go back to 1965 it's like 19 or it's 22 somewhere mm -hmm. in there and it has progressively become you know stretched out more and more from there uh, I know we're going to talk about the uh, women in the workplace that was facilitated by hormonal birth control I can put off having babies and, so, and start focusing on a career that's when we start getting into no-fault divorce. Then we get into, uh, this, this, like all the dominoes start falling right. right from 1965, and there was one invention that triggered all of that. So if you go and you look at the rise of divorce, you look at the decline of marriage, we're at the lowest marriage rates in human history since they started recording it back in like the mid-1800s. Mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> and so you start looking at the, uh, the just this cascade of events that have happened since then. Women become more active in politics. They become more active in religion. They become more active in the American workplace like we're going to talk about here in a moment. Uh, you see things like Title IX becomes a thing. You see more women, like I said, uh, getting into advanced careers and going into college. So when I am answering questions about like, uh, you know, why do you, why is it, Rolo, that uh, was it 60, 40 is the uh, offset or the differential between women who are enrolling in college or enrolling in universities? That's not graduation rates. They graduate at much higher rates than, than mm -hmm. men. Um, all of that, everything that you can point out as some sort of social issue today in 2022, I can go all the way back to 1965 and show you where the spike happens. Mm -hmm. See, I have multiple issues with the birth <coughs> control pill. I mean, some mm -hmm. of it is just health related that I believe it's deeply unhealthy when you look at, you know, and I took mm -hmm. them for six years, you know, full transparency. Mm -hmm. I didn't take them for sexual reasons. I actually mm -hmm. took them because doctors give them to out regulate like candy. Your, to regulate your Oh, yeah. Cycle. Women go into, I mean, I have friends that went into the dermatologist. Oh, I'm breaking out birth control pills. <coughs> You know, they don't ask you about your diet. They don't ask you mm -hmm. about exercise. They don't ask you about anything that's going on in your life. It's just like, here, take mm -hmm. this very serious drug that's going to affect all the hormones in your body. Here, just, you know, like it's nothing, like candy. Mm -hmm. um, you have other women that go in. I was one of them who had an irregular cycle. Here, birth control pills. By the way, that doesn't always fix it. Then you're in mm -hmm. this constant search of finding the right combination of hormones. It's all I was going to say, garbage. I think a lot of people don't, <clears throat> they misunderstand that there are different kinds of hormonal birth control. Yes, there There's were multiple. There's not just one pill. There's I actually like went through kinds. three different types. Mm -hmm. I felt 
like I never felt like myself. I was always bloated. I will say it for me and for many women, it decreases your sex drive, mm -hmm. which is a whole other component that's not spoken about. The way that I related to men, I felt was always off when I was on those <laughs> because I was mm -hmm. off. And it, I finally like sat and I got really healthy. And I mm -hmm. said, okay, I'm going to fix this irregular cycle through diet, exercise. I fixed it completely. I mm -hmm. got off of them. And I remember that first like couple of months being like, wow, this is my actual body? What have I been mm -hmm. living in for the last six years? I was furious. The actually. real you. Yeah. I was absolutely furious with all of those mm -hmm. doctors. You know, let me uh, let me uh, dispel a myth here really quickly because I know that in the chat, I don't even have to see the chat and I know what the chat's going to say. Um, when it comes, like there's been some studies recently where um, they have uh, looked at women who have been on birth control and what they're attracted to in a guy and then they wonder why they want to divorce their husband once they come off of birth control so that they can go and uh, have babies at that point and they're not attracted to their their husbands anymore because when what they were what they were on hormonal birth control yes. is different than what they were once they went off of it um, so I always get this. People will say, well, Rolla, does, doesn't it just trick women's bodies into thinking that they're always pregnant all the time? And so therefore they're looking for guys who are like sort of in the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. They're always looking for the feminine, you know, emotional. That's why we have em emo guys all the time. That's why we have weesh guys who are just like, they're just, they're pansies and they're pussies and everything. Um, yes and no. Um, I think a lot of people misunderstand how, um, and I'm not an endocrinologist by, and I don't play one on the internet either. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> what happens is it doesn't like eliminate your sort of the alpha seed side of, of the menstrual cycle. What it does is it compresses it and it depresses it down. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when you come off of it, all the, all of your nat, like your luteinizing hormone, your FSH, your progesterone at the certain times comes back up to normal levels. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. That can certainly have a, a, an effect on mood and effect on like what your perceptions are of that guy. Yeah, it depresses. But it doesn't, your... it doesn't, it doesn't like trick you. Cause if that were the case, then women on hormonal birth control would never want to get with like guys that look like Justin Waller. <laughs> it depresses <clears throat> your testosterone. I mean, mm -hmm. it does a lot of crazy things. There's a lot of mood swings. Mm -hmm. You also like you smell things differently. Mm -hmm. Very strange. Like I remember smelling cologne differently when mm -hmm. I was on hormonal control contraceptives that when I wasn't all of a sudden I was like oh that's very strong it was mm -hmm. it was a different body composition hormones really guide the body in so many ways so I you know and that's part of the matrix conversation for me because the way they disseminate these big pharma drugs mm -hmm. to me is just absolutely atrocious when oftentimes what's going on in a woman's body that makes her imbalanced has a lot to do with you know pollutants toxins mm -hmm. what she's eating exercise stress and that's just never discussed that's a whole other the conversation. other uh, so the, and the other part of that is like I said there's all there's different kinds of pills yeah there's also norplant there's i believe there is something like shot how I, somebody in the chat will know this like i believe there's something like 60 or 70 different forms of birth control for women there are two for guys mm -hmm. a condom and a vasectomy mm -hmm. right now so i that, know that they're working on male birth control so don't throw that at let me, me ask yet. you about that though mm -hmm. and by the way he, you know rollo mentioned the chat people in the chat super chats will be read today malik is here today he's gonna do us the honor of reading mm -hmm. those so please get on into the chat questions for me questions for rollo comments super chats get red folks but let me ask you about that because the comment that's often thrown out you know, particularly by the modern feminist left is, mm -hmm. well, guys love that they don't have to be responsible for this. They love mm -hmm. that they can pass the baton to women. And if guys had to take birth control or if you had to rely on men to do that, it would be a disaster. You can't count mm -hmm. on them to do it. So it's almost like the, the narrative is that guys would push their women to take birth control above all else. Mm -hmm. your, your reaction. Yes. Male birth control is invented. Women most affected. That's what it will. That that'll be the headline, I'm sure. Is there truth to that in any way? In no. Uh, well, I mean, yes and no. I, I I think that there is this common misperception that the uh, that the the pill right now is in some way this great advancement for guys. Like the only reason the pill exists is so guys can have se casual sex. Like that was the whole selling point. It's like you just told me a minute ago that you took. You, you took birth control to regulate your period. Yeah, I didn't right? take it for, for so, I wasn't even having sex so at that time. I, first of all, I think that's kind of like a, that's kind of like a, a an old wives tale, an old folk tale. It's like, oh, well guys, you know, be, be glad that there is such a thing as hormonal birth control. Okay, fine, yeah, hey, great, you know. Right. But again, we, we, we didn't have even the term casual sex prior to like 1965, prior mm -hmm. to, um, prior to uh, the sexual revolution, um, you know, for the free love movement and everything else, Studio 54, right, mm -hmm. right after, you know, the disco years. Um, but I think that a, a, a male form of birth control that doesn't like mess with your hormones as guys, I know that, I know Vasagel, I know the, oh, don't give me links, I've already seen them all, <laughs> yes, so yeah, thank you very much, either. get out of my DMs with that shit. Um, but 
the 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 problem I think that is running that we're running into right now is like we can put a, a lander on Mars that mm-hmm. lasts seventeen some odd years and we can't still can't figure out how to get how how to find a male b- form of birth control right. It's not that there is we don't have the technology the science for it we lack the will for it right now and i think that one of the reasons why we have those sort of those tropes that are going around like well we can't trust men to take the pill but we can trust women to take the pill well, like it's it's like it's it's a it's like a, and by the way, a an ideological psychological issue by the rather. way women miss pills all the time i mean mm-hmm. all the time sometimes they'll be like oh yeah i'm on birth control and i look at their packet and it's half empty and i'm like mm-hmm. you know it doesn't work if you don't take it every day and more precisely you're supposed to take it every day at the same mm-hmm. time so there's this this idea that women are always responsible about it not necessarily mm-hmm. accurate. I want to just ask you quickly before we get to feminism, because mm-hmm. there's something I found you're going to love. Cool. And, and here, I'm going to say it. Rolla was right about something. What? I, I'm sorry. I'm Rolla a little was right here. about something. <laughs> and yeah, no, you're gonna, I know you love those moments. Yeah, this is where his, whoever the editor is for the Rolla Tomas. You, by the way, you have, you have changed immeasurably since we We're going to talk about that too. We're mm-hmm. going to talk about that too. But I want to um, ask you about the, the, the one thing about birth control pills that I see among women who, you know, I stopped taking them by the time I was 25. I was mm-hmm. done. But I see these Why women did you do who that? take. Why did you, why'd you go off? because I got into health and I was very conscious of the fact that I didn't want to put something synthetic into my body. And I started mm-hmm. eating really well and talking to, you know, naturopaths and they were like, you need to get off of this. And Did I was you like, read something I, that said, you know, get off birth control and you'll feel no, better? No, I just read stuff that I had stuff that was going on in my body that didn't feel right. And I went a very holistic route all across the board in terms mm-hmm. of food, exercise, everything. And that was just part of weeding out. It was the only pharmaceutical that I t- took at the time. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm done. You know, I'm going to fix this on my own. And I did. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was more a commitment to health than anything else, to mm-hmm. be honest, because it wasn't related to sex. I wasn't even having sex mm-hmm. at that period of time. But I want to ask you, I, I have a lot of friends that, you know, took the pills for a very long period of time. And what it created mm-hmm. in their lives was this. They were like serial monogamous. They were like married Multi-branching. without being married. Mm-hmm. And they just weren't procreating. And it was the pill just sort of extended that time. And then I looked mm-hmm. at them and they were like 35 and still in that. I'm like, you're still taking the birth control pill mm-hmm. and living with somebody and you're kind of married, but not married. Mm-hmm. You're not 20 anymore, honey. Like what's going on? So well, mentally, what does that do? So you have to remember, like when, I, if you've read my book, uh, I have a very infamous graph in there where I show that, I think we even talked about this back in July, is that women's uh, peak sexual market value years are right around 23 or 24. Mm-hmm. That is also peak fertility for women. That's the peak uh, window for like, this is the best time to get pregnant. Now people are going to argue and say, no, it's 18, whatever. Okay. In <laughs> modern time, you can shift that bell curve however right. you want to the fact <laughs> remains that there's there there is a, a peak a window of opportunity i think one of the things that is uh, again another effect another side effect uh, a downstream social effect let's just say of hormonal birth control is now the average age of first marriage for women is like 29 28 29 mm-hmm. somewhere around there the average age of first child is right around 30 and i think that in europe it's even later than that oh yeah because Women believe, I think, uh, as a result of really 45 to 50 some odd years of living in the post-sexual revolution society, that they have more time than they actually do. Mm -hmm. So you are an extreme outlier in that you had your child when you were 40. Yes, and got pregnant on the first try. And but that is not, yes. and I say but, to the audience, but you're don't also go very by healthy. Me. You're I also am. you're also within you know weight tolerance. You're not obese. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of other health factors that go along with that as well. However, what I think one of the dirty tricks that we play on women is that we we convince them that they have more time than they actually do in the sexual marketplace, and I mean that in the sense of like fertility windows right. there too. So when, every year after 30, I believe it is, is that it, the uh, the possibility of conceiving a child and carrying a child to term, not having a miscarriage, um, not, you know, carrying, having a healthy child without Down syndrome or, or complications to that uh, increases more and more the, the closer you get to 40 years old. Uh, the research is there. It's robust. You can find it. It's not hard. Use Google. Please don't make me do it for you. Um, it's all out there, but we teach women that they have more time than they actually do. So we teach women two things, FOMO, fear of missing out. Mm-hmm. And that fear of missing out is, well, I can't trust men, so I've got to uh, provide for my own security. So therefore, I got to get a degree. Therefore, I got to have my own business. Therefore, I've got to have, I can't trust men, so I've got to do all this long-term security stuff myself. And then we also convince women that their uh, sexual market value is evergreen. So you have beautiful at any size, beautiful at any age, beautiful at whatever, you know, like you've got women, it's 50, 60 years old who are still using makeup and trying to make themselves look like, what is it? Uh, the, 
the joke is, of course, you know, they call the store Forever 21, mm-hmm. not Forever 41. And the sad thing There's is. There's a reason for that. Man, you go into that store, and I'm not going to lie, you see like 40, 50-year-olds trying mm-hmm. to squeeze into those little, man, it's not it's not a pretty sight audience is mm-hmm. all I'm going to say. You know, so you got to like respect the decade a, you're in. So what, what gets me is like, uh, the, the most common time when you'll hear women say, well, you know, my biological clock is ticking. That, do you know when that is? 30 years old, 29 to 31 years old, right? Yeah. Well, you better put a ring on this because I'm not getting any younger and you know, my biological clock is ticking. No, dear, your biological clock started ticking right around 21, 22 mm. years old because that was the age at which you were most healthy and you had the best options to carry a child to term. And, and, usually, and that's really what hormonal birth control has done is it's convinced generations of women, and I mean four generations of women, that they have more time than they actually do. Mm-hmm. Their sexual market value is evergreen. And I think that that's a, a, a crime that that hormonal birth control, post, uh, post-sexual revolution society is. Yeah, it's like living in the world of delusion, mm-hmm. honestly. People would be, it's, it's, it's sad. It's a sad reality and you see a lot of unhappy women that ultimately have birth. Uh, and then, and then I gotta later. listen to them go, Rolla, where's my guy? Right. I've been well, 30, 40 ex- years old. Exactly and like, right. well, you know, you, you became the man that you wanted to marry. Yeah. Well, I wanna ask you about feminism. You and I had a discussion about feminism I think it was on remote that discussion Mm -hmm. that we had and I was making the argument that feminism was different way back when and Mm -hmm. you were saying well maybe a little but not so much Mm -hmm. it was interesting I found this um, tweet we're gonna go to this tweet do you have that one you could pull up I'm gonna pull it up for the audience I'm gonna read it and share it with you You it'll also probably pop up here for you it's number it's the second one it's number two was feminism way different that back then advice to marriage huh. to young ladies this is from a suffragette I've wife seen this a million. yeah okay. this, is, I had this not gets seen pat- it, it's passed but it's around. fantastic audience mm-hmm. you have to hear this this is from a suffragette wife so this is you know we're talking about when i was saying oh you know those feminists were worrying about women's rights and voting rights this is interesting mm-hmm. one do not marry at all number two but if you must avoid the beauty men i'm assuming they mean like handsome men you know flirts and the bounders those are the troublemakers Taylor's dummies and the football enthusiasts so the masculine men avoid them at all costs look for a strong tame man interesting choice of words a fire lighter coal getter window cleaner and yard swiller don't expect this is except it says expect too much most men are lazy selfish thoughtless lying drunken clumsy heavy-footed rough unmanly brutes and need taming Mm. fascinating all bachelors are, and many are, worse she still. Part. I do. Hey, you need to be I tamed. I can't believe this nonsense. Don't be taming my men. Mm-mm. By no. the way, when I watch your show, I watch what you like. Oh, yeah. Right oh, yeah. Off. The same remark applies to dogs, they say. If you want him to be happy, feed the brute. How unbelievably condescending. Oof. You will be wiser not to chance it. It isn't worth the risk. So this was eye-opening for me mm-hmm. because I, you know, grew up really defending a lot of the modern feminists, particularly the ones that were fighting for, you know, opportunity, not a quality of outcomes, but a quality of opportunity. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting to see that a lot of the tenets of modern feminism that I loathe, which is essentially man-hating in many capacities, mm-hmm. was actually woven through oh, yeah. the initial messaging. Yeah. So you get a you were right about this because <laughs> no, you know me. And listen, you know my commentary well enough to know that when I'm wrong, I come back and say Good. there's something in there Thank that's much and that's really bothersome to me. Mm-hmm. Um, to be honest with you, because I think a lot of women uphold the founding movement as something to be proud of because it mm-hmm. gave them the opportunity to do a lot of things they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. But then here, woven through, this sounds like Gloria Steinem, man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, I I uh, when we were having that discussion, I have done my my homework on the suffragettes and the the waves of feminism. I think it is a misnomer to call first wave feminism, second wave feminism. For what? Where are we? What wave are we in right now? I don't even know. Uh, it's, it's all the same. It's, wave, it's I'd say. always been the same movement, and I wish we would stop saying, "Oh, well, the the suffragettes were good; they got the right to vote." Yeah, well, you know, not at the time. You have to remember that I usually track feminism as far back as like eight, I think it's 1848, 1849 at Seneca Falls when they had the uh, the convention for like the suffragettes. I yeah. think is what got it kicked off. There's only 300 people at that convention, by the way. Um, and so from that point, it kind of spread through the United States and then the UK and everything else. And there was there was a lot of opposition to it at the time. And then you got to remember that it was ostensibly about the vote, the way that we looked at voting and democracy and how we did how we elect. You know, we, we did it much differently back in the 1800s and the early 1900s than we do now. There's a much different attitude about it. Uh, you had to have skin in the game, basically, is what it was about. Mm. Um, and, and I mean, without making a, a really super long, drawn out uh, uh, episode here. Um, 
essentially the suffragettes from about 1850 until they received the vote in 1920 with the 19th Amendment being ratified, uh, they went through the, the suffragists themselves. Remember, that's like, what's that, 70 years? Mm -hmm. 70, yeah. 70 years from yes. Seneca Falls all the way to 1920. That, if that's first wave feminism, you also have to look at the fact that they were also considered terrorists back then because they were responsible for bombing police precincts. They plotted assassinations mm -hmm. of, of officials. They were, I'm not going to say they were the Taliban at the time, but they're the more militant side of the suffragettes. People just sweep that under the carpet all they want to say is well we got the right to vote it's like yeah but you had 70 years before you got the right to vote so what was going on back then and there was a lot of uh like i said they they were treated as if they were terrorists and then of course there was um women who were uh oppo you know just vehemently opposed to it I, they weren't taken seriously in the beginning of course but then like when they became more taken more seriously um, that's when things escalated at that point. I don't think enough people, there's a, a really great book and it's called The Suffragette Bombers, I think is what the, mm, one of the, one of the books that I was reading. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, history there that people just don't want to acknowledge. And so when I say there's no such thing as waves of feminism, the feminism, the suffragette movement, whatever, it's all has the common root. It all has the, con the we're just looking at it right here. Um, all the way through like prohibition, all the way through um, social upheaval, World War One, World War II. Um, it, it, the waves of feminism are just the same thing. They've just been separated by social mm -hmm. unrest and warfare and, and, and social things that were going on at the time. And then, of course, what happens again, right at 1965, what happens then? We have the sexual revolution. And that's where we usually demark the third wave feminists like Gloria Steinem, Betty Oof. Friedan and all that. That's when we say, oh, well, they had, you know, we, they got us into the workplace and da, 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 da. And like, I would say that that's right around the time when gyne the gynecologists centric social order sort of mm -hmm. uh, sprang up at that point and that's when f that movement could come into its own because it finally had the invention that gave women the complete control mo most mostly unilateral control over reproduction so then you get roe v wade then mm. you get um then you get uh, on demand with it's like uh they, there's many states in the united states that don't even keep records of why a woman is getting an abortion because that's like an invasion of her privacy mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of things that happen, again, because of HBC, but one of the things that happened is that it, it gave women sort of this open door to do what they couldn't do in 1850, 1920, all the way up to where they're at right now. You know, and I, I'm deeply appreciative of my right to vote. I take that very seriously. I, I view that as a, as a deep privilege. I love to go vote. I feel very empowered when I do it. So I'm personally mm -hmm. not looking to roll back any of the rights. I'm not either. And I think women. a lot of people but, but, think but, that but, I am. I'm no, not. no. But what's interesting about mm -hmm. it, I think that needs to be acknowledged, is something I talk about. I don't know if you know Jesse Kelly. He's a political commentator. He and I talk about this all the time. He tweets about it all the time. There is a reality that there is a problem with the female vote in this country. Mm -hmm. It's a perpetual nightmare. I mean, that is who Democrats and the hard left talk 68 to. Sixty-eight percent of single it's, women it's vote Democrat. Unbelievable. I mean, mm -hmm. that is the voting block that guarantees that Democrats get elected. And without that single female, they're in big, big trouble. So you look at the marketing. I mean, all the woke stuff, all the fear mongering, all the fear mm -hmm. politics around rights to abortion and whatnot. That's all targeted toward that young single female. Mm -hmm. So you can simultaneously say, "I don't want to roll back any rights for women," and acknowledge the fact that the female voter is a very emotional voter that's a reality and that the young single female voter is an enormous problem when it comes to instituting conservative values in the country that's well, just a reality that's one of the reasons why elizabeth warren made a big deal about uh what is it student debt uh forgiveness yep. as far back as march yep. of this year uh and they were already like it's what i call tilling the fields they were um, they were getting ready for an election cycle where they had to at least make it plausible that this is sort of like the year of the woman. And so then you had the uh, the uh, Supreme Court leak leak. And then uh, right after that, of course, you had the uh, Roe v. Wade being kicked back to the states. You didn't lose your right to abortion. It was just kicked back to the states where it was That's before right. where it should be. Frankly. And so uh, and so, of course, what happens then is it's like that is setting a narrative that they carried all the way into November. And it, and I'll tell you, man, leftist progressivist ideology is the it, it is transferred not from 
father to son, it's from family to daughter. And there's uh, right. there's all kinds of research, uh, quantitative research that shows mm -hmm. that uh, le uh, left progressivist Democrat ideology is passed from the family to the daughter and the daughter carries it on from mm -hmm. there. And that ideology in my and women, I should also say, are, are far. And the, again, there's been lots of studies on this on uh, university campuses where women will sacrifice the uh, right to free speech for the right to inclusivity oh, and of for course. egalitarianism. Of course. And so I, there's there's all kinds no of question. there's all kinds of uh, of data that backs this up. But the, the the long and the short of it is that women tend to vote for egalitarian, more socialist, communitarian mm -hmm. uh, social yeah. policies Huge as problem. opposed to free speech and independence and li uh, liberty. I don't know what else yeah. to call it. But That's a hundred percent true, and it's a huge cancer on the country. It really is the fact that those policies are instituted. I've made the I've made the case in the past that it's like when we look at men men organize society hierarchically right. because that's just that's the way we are right women tend to organize society uh com in a community i want you to save that for the workplace okay because well, that's good for sure. the workplace i want to check in with malik with the chat you got some chats coming up for us yeah we got a few so we let's got go on five dollars from thomas vandenberg jay what has changed since the first time you interviewed rollo yeah. that has made you more open-minded to what rollo is discussing that's good i want i'm going to answer that um uh, but let's get to the other His one good looks and charming those. smile <laughs> yes, there uh, you go all right we got one for two dollars from simon Levive. At Michael Sertain, <laughs> have me on your potty. <laughs> People Thanks. pitching themselves. As well, I, Thanks, talk. Tinder Swindler. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, we got another one from Sancho Bohemian, $5 for Rolo and Bila. Open up women's eyes, X. And then $1 from Destiny Fan. There's no message. Thank oh, you. Man. Thank you, $1. Oh, dollar. You got the trolls That's in there. That's your $1. I love it. Well, you it's like the whenever trolls. he's reading names, and I'm like, okay, that guy. Now, okay, what about PP? What about the rest of these guys? Like, way, I those know are him by all name. different people than usually are in here. So oh, yeah. That's your crew, oh, they man. Follow me. That's your crew. So, and that's an interesting question about what has changed. They're my, and They're my trolls. There you go. Well, listen, you have to more power to you, man. It's good. It, you know you. They may be Spurgs, but they're my Spurgs. You know you've made it when you have people out there who are trolling you. Mm -hmm. um, so someone asked um, what had changed. And I think really, you know, I come into every single forum that I enter with an open mind. And mm -hmm. I sat and I talked to you. And I really started thinking about some stuff. And I came to realize that a lot of my knee-jerk reaction had really been programmed. And the way, if I sat back and I looked at the way I was actually living my life, what was going mm -hmm. on in my house, the way my husband and I interact, I really was living very much in line with what you were saying. Mm -hmm. But when you would say it, the words would trigger me to respond. Like I had mm -hmm. some obligation as a modern woman, as someone who existed mm -hmm. in this world to respond a certain way. As a woman, as let a woman. me tell you. Right, something. and, I, and I, mm -hmm. I think you have to really like sit with that, be able to kind of acknowledge it. And it takes a lot of like, you know, you have to be willing to say I was wrong. In fact, I'm going to mm -hmm. do a video. People need to, um, people are going to want to see this. I did, I, I did commentary when I first came out here about self-defense and Andrew mm -hmm. Tate. You wait, because on Friday, I'm going to be doing, Jed takes the takedown of Jed. Jed does the takedown of Jed. You guys are not one of them. I'm glad you're that. doing it, and I don't have yeah, to. Yeah, listen, but you know. It's, I did all my, I, I, by the way, I went back, of course, you know, full disclosure here. I went back and watched our first uh, our first yeah. episode before we went on. I'm like, okay, what's different between now? And yeah. what, I think it was in mid-July, somewhere around there. And, um, and I, I was listening to the parts where you're talking about like, oh, we have a 50 50 relationship and like with your, you and yeah. your, your husband and everything. That was one thing. And there's some other parts well, in there too. And I'm is? like, I'm like, she has definitely changed because I heard you talking about like how men need to be the heads of the house. But you know what now. it is that's strange? <laughs> when I sat and thought about that, like mm -hmm. my instinct is to say that because I feel very supported in my household. I love him. He loves me. But the reality is that I do sit back on a lot of stuff just naturally. It's not like mm -hmm. we walked in the door and established this dynamic of like, I'm head of household and this it just kind of happened that way and I'm really mm -hmm. comfortable sitting back on a lot of stuff because that's my personality and I I know I sit in front of this mic and everyone sees this person but I go home and I'm just like yeah babe you know whatever you want whatever mm -hmm. works you know you know best he's I always say he's my better half he's my smarter half he is and I I think I just heard what you were saying and just absorbed it and instead of having like instead of going home and being angry mm -hmm. I just kind of sat with it and said you know what I think he's right about this and maybe That's I don't know a if rare I quality in a woman right it now is. insight is a very well and pe but people I've in general but like, like yeah. and I'm the first one to admit and everyone in the audience knows when COVID started I was the first one to come out here and say everyone I was an idiot I was washing the walls Rolo mm -hmm. I bought the story I was an idiot I had a four month old I was afraid it was horrible and then I quickly woke up and became one of the fiercest 
justice fighters against mandates and protecting mm-hmm. people's freedoms and all that. So I just wouldn't feel like I would have any right to sit at this mic and See, have this job if I didn't have the ability to say mm-hmm. on this, I was wrong. Mm-hmm. So that's what it is. It's just a self-reflection. That's honestly. why I always make a, a point, And I've done this uh, on a certain talk show that I was on not too long ago. To point Dr. out Dr. Phil, that the, yeah, you it. can say it. I, it's not Phil. supposed to come out of my mouth. Well, um, it's going to air and I'm yeah, going to know when it airs. And by it. the way, audience, when it does air, I'm going to pull clips. And I'm gonna oh, yeah. It. Yeah, I'm sure they're <laughs> going to butcher me. Uh, anyways, uh, the, the the point is that um, I think that when I am explaining red pill topics, I try to do it from an, an antiseptic, objective, uh, rational pr- perspective, uh, you know, devoid of emotions, devoid of ideology. Um, simply because it needs to be a social, a political, a religious, a whatever. Um, and so when I hear somebody say, well, the red pill ideology is the, (laughs) it's like, it's not an ideology. I've said that to you actually. It's the, it's the red pill. You got your philosophy is like nothing like like you want to trigger Rolo. It's call call the red pill philosophy because as I've said in the past, I'll say it right now, the red pill is a praxeology and exactly what you just said a minute ago here is, is why I do because we write down things in pencil. We don't put it in pen. Mm -hmm. We still have erasers. We can say, you know what? We were wrong about that. Let's take that out and let's put our new analysis here. That's why I call it a praxeology. I realize I'm kind of bastardizing the word, but that's as close as I can get to it Mm -hmm. because it's kind of a loose science. So, as we get more information about things, if somebody says, hey, man, hypergamy is nonsense. Here's all this new data about it. Oh, OK, well, we'll erase that part and we'll put in That's whatever right. it is. And so what you're doing here is you're saying, you know what? I thought about that. I erased that part and I wrote something yeah. new. In time. Yeah. And that's what it's about to be. A, I advocate all the time for people to be free thinking people. You can't be a free thinking mm-hmm. person if you're not willing to look at what you've said. You're part of that equation. Mm-hmm. You know, you're a growing thinking person. So that's really what it is. Um, if you see a change, it's just because I feel like I'm you know, thinking. I'm actually sitting here and thinking about what's being said. It's a mark of an intelligent person. Well, I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciate I know there's some people well, that when I first you. started doing the commentary, were like, oh, you know, and I was I like, can't believe you're going back <laughs> I know, with that I know, again. I know. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about this. This is a clip mm-hmm. from, um, I don't know where I pulled this from, from your show, I guess. Mm-hmm. Actually, my husband pulled this clip. He was like, you should talk about this. And I said, you know does what, Jeremy, Jeremy you're watch right. my stuff. Is he, he does. like your, uh, he, he does, does OPSEC on so me? So we co produced this show, but like I said, he is my better half. He is my smarter half. That's the reality. Um, so he'll pull stuff and be like, I think this would interest you. And this is one of the things that came up. It was about, a, it was a very quick comment you made about a red pill dating game that someone asked you. Mm-hmm. I'm going to play the clip. So you, sometimes I know as we kind of forget I've what done we a lot say. Of clips. <laughs> well, I'm not, see now I'm separating between my show and now I'm doing access. No, this Vegas is your show. Or... So let's play mm-hmm. that clip for Rolo just to remind him of the question. And I want to ask him about it. It's at one fifteen. The dating game, but with a red pill slant. Mm, go talk to the guys and. Uh... Attention on deck. Oh, oh see. You gotta add. This is why I was gonna say this is why I don't stream it. There you go. I read the lines. Would that be a good to bring men back and men and women back together? No, it wouldn't. You know why? Because chicks will uh, because you will lose control of that show and it will be taken over by women who will then turn it into turn your male space of a quote unquote dating show into a chick thing. That's why. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so we can stop it there. That was such an interesting question for mm-hmm. me because I, you and I had that conversation about The Bachelor and the way they just humiliate men. If you mm-hmm. turn on any modern dating show, the men are humiliated. I mean, by and large, and they walk into it. Mm-hmm. They go in. They want to do it. I don't know if they want the fame or what it is, but it's interesting to me. I think the idea of a red pill dating show could be fascinating, but it would have to exist in alternate space, YouTube, Rumble. Mm-hmm. Because if you, you're right, if you put that on mainstream television, even if you had the intention of doing it as a red pill show, one, producers Mm. would want to do it in a way that would mock any sort of red pill, anything. That's number one. And number two, they would have to, they would have to emasculate those guys because Mm. the audience would anticipate it and expect it. Mm -hmm. And they would have an agenda going in. If they were going to air this, it would be for the purpose of humiliation, Mm. degradation and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But it would be interesting. Do you think something like that could show, pop up on okay. YouTube, though? I think if it did, it would have a very short run. Put you it think that so? Way. Um, simply because it would ne- it would cease to be a red pill show after a while. And that, I think that was a point I was making in but that what clip. You, do, you could do it. You could do the, the I red could pill do, Yeah, I could. But they, yeah, I really want to sell out. Yeah, here's your red meat for the red pill. <laughs> People no, would watch Roll on. Yes, not going to lie. Yes, they probably would. Yeah, what, what was it? Chuck Woolery who did the, the dating <laughs> the show. Love the Connection. Love Connection. Yeah, yeah I could be, ch- I could be ch- the I red pill it. Chuck Woolery. Thank you. I watched you. it. I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> I did. Um, 
No, I, the reason why I was saying that is because I think I was talking about the recent interview between Sean Reynolds and like Fresh. And because mm-hmm. like Myron and Fresh went out to the UK, they went on a tour recently. And of course, you've already probably seen the clips of Andrew Tate on with uh, Sean Reynolds. She has mm-hmm. this yes. show. Uh, it's called Grilling, I think is what it's called. But it's like yeah. this you go on this sort of mock date. And of course, Tate has like probably seven or nine million, probably nine million, you know, views on that one right now. Myron and Fresh both went and did that. And so. It's it separately. It, it, yeah, separately. They both went on separate dates. They're very different. Oh yeah, it was it was fascinating too. But I thought it was great because they actually got some really good you know sort of red pill points on there. the The problem is is that as I said on our first meeting together is that women don't want to be told that they're playing a game. They want to play the game. Mm-hmm. That's a problem. Is that it sort of strips away all of the magic and all the emotion and all the right. feels that go along with. Uh, you know, learning something new about someone. And if you go and you, the prime example of all this, if you go and you watch like Myron, when he's on the, when he's having his, uh, his date, date with, uh, with Sean Reynolds, he's just like, he's like a, 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 a scientist. He just goes in there like a surgeon and just cuts up every, every single, they're not on a date. He's yeah. there to make red pill points. So it's like, right. are you there to like, to sort of play the game or are you there to explain the game? And that would be, mm-hmm. I would say the, be the main difficulty between doing a, you know, a, a red pill dating game. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been on Myron and Fresh's show with, uh, with several guys who I guess Hotep Jesus was on there with me one time. And I was on there with all the girls in an after hour show and I could be there and I could explain all the dynamics and everything that they were talking about and why you're, why, you know, your peak sexual market value years are 23. Well, I can, I'm Mr. Wizard, right? I'm an, super analytical about everything, but I'm stripping away the game. Mm-hmm. Then Hotep Jesus comes in there and he's like, yeah, we just vibe and man, he knows everything that I'm talking about, but he takes that and he still plays the, you know, he plays the, the role kind of mm-hmm. thing. He knows what's going on like analytically, but he can still, speak womanese he can still speak womanese. emotional to him so it's like so women go they don't even know what to call it so they go oh but, but we're vibing we're vibing you know, it's, it, you know there's this like sort of emotional connection right there yeah there is because you're playing the game instead of explaining the game women yeah. do not want to have the game explained to them that's, that's why a red pill dating show would fail because you have to explain things to to women as you're going along oh the reason why you wore that red cocktail dress today <laughs> is because you're ovulating and those hoop earrings right there that's sexual can ornamentation and Oh, yeah. See, you wore uh, high heels too. lift your ass up, you know what, uh, four inches so that, you know, you're a you'd have l- like, lordosis. You'd you know? have like feminists watching that, you know, the old school cartoon. <laughs> it'll be fun the, for a while. Fires coming out of their ears. They're just losing it. Mm-hmm. You'd have, it'll like, be, it'll oh, be very man. entertaining for it. the for the three months that it would run. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then banned, suspended. Mm-hmm. Vibe. All right. I want to talk about the workplace becoming feminized. I, that was really interesting to me. Um, and I have some thoughts on it. There's a clip of you. We're going to go to 124.19 Malik and play that clip um, all the Oh, by the way, before we do that, because I just saw it on the screen, hit that subscribe button. People, do I have to come to your home and make you hit that subscribe button? I'll do it. You know I will. Or I'll send Rolo, which is even worse. Hit that subscribe. Hit that like if you like what's going on right now. If you want to see more in-person guests like Mr. Tomasi here. And now we're going to talk about the workplace. Do you work in a workplace that has become feminized, people at home? Mm. Uh Uh-oh. This is going to be controversial. Let's go. The American workplace has become more sort of feminized, let's say. Um, simply because we've put women into male space. And as a result of that, as a result of accommodating women's uh, needs, feelings, uh, you know, we, we've empowered women to become these sort of independent, you know, strong, independent women. And so we take that, so we have to take that to its logical conclusion, right? So we put them into the American workplace. Well, what do they do when they get in there? Are they just as competitive as men? Are they just, no, what they, that women tend to focus on their condi- the work conditions. That's why you have uh, companies that never had like pregnancy leave. And I'm saying this is actually a good thing. I never had pregnancy leave. You put women in the, into the situation. They say, we really need to get pregnancy leave as a, as a benefit. Okay, good. You know, most companies, you know, foreign companies will do that too. That's a, that's that I can get behind. Then you got bagel Tuesdays <laughs> and then you got talent shows that's and then true. you got, Ball pits. Yeah. For, it's Brad's you know, birthday. Time. Let's have a cake. Got, you know, child care. <laughs> okay, got... stop there. When you said the bagels, bagels I lost my mind because it's true. It's true. And this mm-hmm. is that this is what I'm talking about, though. That I think sometimes women there's that defensive reflex. Mm-hmm. But just sit back and realize that you, as a female, like ladies at home, please, mm-hmm. like I would be somebody that would want that bagel Tuesday. I'd be like, oh, it'd be so fun. You know, you know it. Own it. 
So this is interesting to me, though, because I think there is some truth to this in terms of how women are when they get into these spaces. And because we crave that work-life balance so much, mm -hmm. I think we try to then bring it into these work structures. Mm -hmm. However, in the modern world, I think that you now have that being led by women, that movement, and feminized men. Mm -hmm. There are so many men I know, so many men, particularly in the cities, they want to turn work into a playground. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like they want to behave like a small child and, oh, let's play little games. Let's call it team building and spend the whole Talent day. Talent shows. Yeah, ping pong mm -hmm. for everyone. Yeah. I mean, so there's yeah. a, a there's a two-tier problem. You have women behaving as you might anticipate women would, and now you have men behaving like women mm -hmm. and advocating for the same Absolutely. things. Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, with I that? would definitely agree with that. Uh, the What I was getting into in that clip. So I have uh, I'm, two, two names to remember here. One is Josh Fluke, and the other one is Aaron Clary, who's a very good friend of mine. John, Josh Fluke as well. Um, when I started thinking about this, and I, I this was a result that you're giving very recent clips. Thank you very much for not going back in time and <laughs> no, no, getting the time that. machine for me. Mm -mm. Um, the, I've, I've written several articles about this, and I know that uh, Aaron Clary has written as well about this, is that when you put women into male spaces, they tend to try to assimilate that male space into something that is more comfortable and more, more uh, feminine friendly. <laughs> And um, I've, if you've read, I think it's my second book in, in preventive medicine, I actually have a chapter called Male Space. Um, I was listening to the channels, uh, I think it was, it was Josh Fluke. Josh Fluke, is, he was a coder who kind of be, got into the hustle economy and then he becomes a, a, a very popular uh, YouTube channel guy. And he was talking about the American workplace and one of them was about how women come into that workspace and then suddenly there's a ball pit that shows up here, you know, like it's like the, you know, the place playground at Dis or at, M at McDonald's, right? You know, there's a, there's a, a bagel Tuesdays. That's where I took it. Sorry, Josh, I stole your line. The bagel Tuesdays, right? Or a talent show, or mm -hmm. uh, we need a team building or we need this. Mm -hmm. And it's, it becomes more about the social aspect and making the, the American work life tolerable for women who are coming into the American workspace. And so it's, it ceases to become a, a, um, a competitive hierarchical organization and it, be, it then becomes a more communitarian organization. I was saying before, mm -hmm. when women organize societies, it's all about communitarianism. It's all about egalitarianism. For men, it's hierarchical. Who is the, who is the, uh, the chief? Who's the, the CEO, the CFO? And then on down the hierarchy down to the janitor, right? right. Same thing in the military. Who's the, who's the admiral? Who's the general? Who's, I'm gonna, and yeah. Mike's gonna roll me over here for this, but like all the way down to the private, right? Yeah. We do chain of command. There you go. Um, and that's just how men organize society. It's like, it's by merit. Ideally, it's by merit. And so whoever does the best job earns the more money. So that there's been experiments and research done on this where they will give men a certain uh, amount of resources and women like money or whatever. And they'll say, okay, distribute this. Women tend to distribute the uh, resources more evenly and egalitarian, like mm. one for you and one for you and one for you and yeah, one for you. That's... And guys will go, uh, okay, uh, Rob, you did a better job than, than Joe mm. over here, so you're getting ten dollars. And uh, Joe, you did a great job here. You get you get seven dollars, and it's like on down by performance as opposed to uh, like you know who gets who gets what. And so um, when you take the female way of organizing society and you put it into the American workplace, or you put it into the U.S. military for that matter, or you put, you want to know where all this sort of wokesy agenda comes from, all the idea that we can have a quote unquote, you know, it was AOC talking about like it was a democratic socialism. Like, how are we even having this conversation in the United States right now? Well, the reason is, is because we put so many women into the politics since 1965, right after mm -hmm. hormonal birth control. Um, that that sounds like a good idea right now. When we say, guys, don't go to university right now because it's a socialist, communist indoctrination camp, you know, major universities, yep. or don't send your daughters there because she'll go in as this puritanical, you know, Bible study girl and she'll come out looking like, you know, Lena Dunham afterwards. <laughs> Like that's like the reason why that is, is because we're looking at a, a an education academia is is almost entirely assimilated by the female imperative. So mm -hmm. yeah, so socialism sounds pretty good to you know call it you know to, to 77, 80 percent of your uh, teachers from the time you're in preschool all the way to you get to post grad. Mm -hmm. um, so. It's, this isn't me just sort of like trying to, f you know, ramrod, you know, gender politics into everything. It's like you can look at every, every step of the way, whether it's the American workplace, whether it's politics, whether it's religion. I wrote a whole book on three years, took me three goddamn years to write the, the fourth book to show people that 
it's being the religions are being assimilated the political process is being assimilated they used to be male spaces that women are that men you know feminized men bring in and want to have in that space and it fundamentally changes the space mm -hmm. and i use this uh this example is like when the wnba was a thing for a while they couldn't get anybody they couldn't put asses in the seats they didn't have it was very right. unpopular nobody cared about it and so what they they were seriously discussing was to have uh, to lower the baskets they wanted to because a girl's because life under the that you couldn't dunk you know the life under the rim is pretty boring right so they were actually talking about changing the game fundamentally changing the game by lowering the baskets so the little ladies could dunk right and maybe that would put asses in the seats what happens is you've changed the nature of the game to suit the playing mm. abilities of the participants. So when we say, um, and of course this is coming to bite people in the ass right now because now we want to believe that you know men and women are just the same, and and so but if they were, then we wouldn't need to lower the baskets in the WNBA. We wouldn't right. have to go and do those kinds of things. But what happens is, is it fundamentally changes the nature of the game. Mm -hmm. So. When you put women into the American workplace, it ceases to be this uh, group of hierarchical guys forming a corporation to compete against another group of hierarchical mm -hmm. guys who want to kill, want to you know at least you know, buy buy you out at the at the very nicest or completely destroy you. And so you've got this healthy competition in capitalism, mm -hmm. in hierarchical corporation after hierarchical corporation. When you put women into those organizations, the first thing that they do is they look for uh, how do I how do we make this this experience I, I, this is supposed to be success so how can i make this success which seems pretty miserable more tolerable so i need daycare i need pregnancy leave i need a ball pit i need bagel tuesdays i need a, a birthday ball party, pit. whatever whatever it is yeah i need to turn it into the play era but so but i mean i'm, I'm exaggerating no, of I course know. but Sometimes. what happens is some you, companies not so, so what happens is those corporations that were in some cases very successful corporations have been around since the you know mm. the turn of the century um, become something other than what they were. It's like the WNBA is not basketball if the if the net is down here. Those corporations don't stay the same right. as they were before. They become less competitive because you have be, because they become more female friendly and more mm -hmm. more uh, feminine specific. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, that I, we want to say you know we really 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 want women to like be. Uh, be these you know go-getters and these alpha females and then you get somebody like uh, Elizabeth Holmes mm -hmm. who we really wanted to be the female version of Steve Jobs to the point where we're putting her face on, on the cover of Forbes and all these mm -hmm. magazines and she's she's the second coming of, mm -hmm. of, of Steve Jobs they really really wanted her to be uh, you know the this kick-ass you know they wanted her to be an Elon Musk whatever and now she's, I think she's going away for 17 years. Is that what, mm -hmm. what it is for yeah. fraud or something like yeah. that? And that's that's the desperate, that's the social narrative that is so desperate to see, to see a woman in a male, uh, uh, in male space and mm -hmm. that we will completely try to change reality to fit the fact that she's she's a fraud. She's yeah. absolutely well, a fraud. Well, it's, it's to try to make it, you know, fair, gender equity, fair and balanced, all these words that they often mm -hmm. throw out. Well, actually. lowering the baskets would make things fair, wouldn't it? Well, that's true. But and it and changes you, the game. You also see that with lowering of standards. We've had conversations. I don't know if I had it with you. Military combat. Yeah. Not only military, mm -hmm. but firemen, police mm -hmm. officers. This is a, a topic we're talking about all the time. In fact, the other day I talked about sports, and I was talking about Megan Rapinoe mm -hmm. and how she wanted this pay equity, but the reality is that people just don't care about women's soccer the same way they care about men's soccer. Mm -hmm. The money's not there because people aren't going to the games and they got the it too didn't they get it there. didn't they get it the soccer team i, I don't follow sports really well, i thought it was talk I, about I, pay equity. I, I, so here's my here's here's my funny story about that she it? said she was gonna get it though by the way she so was like if I'm that's gonna... so if that's the case if they deserve to be paid more then i'm gonna go start an only fans <laughs> And I am going to raise bloody hell right. for not making a hundred thousand dollars a yes. month for selling pictures of my white ass on on OnlyFans, and, and I'm going to demand that I make a hundred thousand dollars a month as a top zero zero point four percent creator because that's mm. pretty much ain't nobody want to see my white ass yeah the difference is though that the only person that would be screaming for that equity for would be you it would be just be you alone on an island and yeah. the difference but is that's that how when, when it comes just as to, how ridiculous when it, it comes to megan rapinoe mm -hmm. there's a whole team of media and whatnot interviewing her talking about this because again it's not it's about the visual of like they would rather have an equal number of men and women doing something and have that reduce the efficiency of what's going on than mm -hmm. actually have more men and less women and have the efficiency kept at the top whether you're talking about police firefighters material 
military, uh, military. It's not about anything but this impression of equity. Well, it's performance based, is what it is. It's like if your performance. Well, is they don't so want it to good. be performance based. Well, no, of course, because the the female way of organizing society is is oh, one for you and one for you mm. and one for you and oh, Jill, you're pregnant. Here's two for you and then one for you. It's mm. this equal distribution yeah. at the cost of of competitiveness that. Megan Rapinoe, she's she she's very popular because that's the narrative right now because right. we're in a gynocentric narrative. So when that's why I use the OnlyFans example <laughs> yes. right there, right? it was just ridiculous. But it's ridiculous because we can see that it's merit based when girls are competing with girls mm -hmm. on OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to say, oh, we want to can, can girls play this game, too, guys, right. can we be in the clubhouse, too? Well, it's not, it's, again, it's uh, uh, equality of opportunity versus equality, equality of, outcome. of outcomes. And so equality of outcome is almost always going to be communitarian, mm -hmm. one for you, one for you, one for you, whereas performance-based is hierarchical for men. So yes, the, when you're playing competitive sports, you're goddamn right, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's hierarchical. I mean, and you're talking about it, and we're going to get to an MSNBC clip in a minute I want you to see, but you're talking about it in terms of how women organize versus men. Mm -hmm. And it's, there are so many men now, now, though, I call them, you know, I talk about modern women a lot. We also have to talk about modern mm -hmm. men and what that means. They are so feminized. Also, they're oftentimes socialists. Mm -hmm. They're outright communists in many respects. They're really arguing for the same things that you're saying that women generally lend toward, lend themselves toward. It's the same view of the world. It's that same like equality of outcomes. It's that same, let's make everything look equal. That's all that matters. Even if, you know, performance suffers, even if it's in the worst interest of the country. I mean, you're talking about the military. Those are the people that's supposed mm -hmm. to be on the front lines. Mm -hmm. These people don't care. In fact, I would argue that in many respects, those people are trying to destroy the when military and has destroyed the country. When you can't ignore it anymore, uh, when you can't ignore that the number 463rd best male swimmer is the number one female swimmer mm -hmm. in as a transgender athlete. That's yeah. unignorable. And by the way, has, has anyone seen any female who has become a transgender and become male? Are they competing at that same level as mm -hmm. men in those sports? No, you don't hear about them at mm -hmm. all. You only hear about it going the other way because we can see the performance difference mm -hmm. between a man and a woman. In they won't sports. talk about that, though. They'll just make sure you got your pronouns in your Twitter bio. And if you're on the, on the cool team in the cool club, that's all that matters I should to also people. point out, we just talked about suffragettes and all that stuff yeah. a minute ago. Um, and since we're, we're on this topic... Uh, it's no coincidence that Marxism started right around the same time as uh, mm. the suffragette movement, and they found they found common cause together at that time. Because when you look at communism, you look at so well socialism, then communism. Uh, it's uh, they're they're very so similar that they make good bedfellows, mm. and so um, both of them are are based on a. Uh, a failed or a false uh, understanding of human nature because if you go and you look at Marxism it's based on a, a uh, an understanding of human nature from like the early 1800s or the right. 1700s right uh, same thing for the suffragette movement at that time so that's how you get those like the the list that you wrote there just a moment ago mm -hmm. um, it's it's uh, it's a demonization of of a certain class it's uh, against the other it's tribe versus tribe but it's based on a faulty way of thinking about human nature, which, by the way, we have a much better education of today in 2022. I want to get to MSNBC. This is a tweet. Um, I, you know, I don't even know where to begin with this. This is an odd clip probably for me to play for you, but you are a parent as well. I and I, I want you to just hear this. This is something that's deeply troubling to me in terms of the trend. And it kind of, for the audience, you know, I talk about the Matrix the a lot. Press. It kind of wa weaves itself into that conversation we have about the Matrix. Let's just listen to what she, she says. Even still that's Representative Catherine Clark. Let's listen. <laughs> but they've also given us a model to become our own leaders. And let me tell you what it means to, to me coming in as a different generation. I remember my middle child waking up with nightmares over concern around climate change. Okay, but that's all I need. That's all I need. So first no, of all, things that never happened. First of all, things that never <laughs> happened. No child on their own is sitting up all night worried about climate change. And I think we see an age now. You are a parent. Mm -hmm. We see an age of indoctrination where you have these psychotic parents, these adults that are overgrown babies that have a deep level of paranoia at every level. And whether it's climate change or whether it's having your mask on 24-7. You didn't watch An Inconvenient Truth back in 1999. <laughs> I know, right? Really? I know. But think about 
about it in light of the last few years with the masks? How many kids did you see? I saw so many kids that had this fear of taking that mask off mm-hmm. because they had crazy parents who were telling them, if you go outside, people are the enemy. You're going to get sick. You're going to get this. You're going to get that. The next wave from the matrix will be climate change. That will be the talking point that is used to instill fear into people to mess this entire country up, whether it's regulation or going after farms or telling you mm-hmm. the cow is the problem, eat bugs, whatever it is. But as a parent, when you look at these psych psychotic parents Mm -hmm. and it's not just parents that are just parents some of them are teachers in schools these adults that have this need now to indoctrinate at every level and we're churning out paranoid frustrated panicked anxiety-ridden children as a result of these paranoid parents Mm -hmm. what do you say uh well first off that's the it's the indication of the narrative so when we're looking at uh climate change when we look any any like hot button issue right now you have to kind of follow what's the latent purpose of it like what's what's going on behind it i think our for example our election process is no longer about actual elections it's about crafting a narrative that provides plausible deniability for whatever shenanigans happen on election day, right? We're, oh, we, we got, we, we did a, remember, can, can you remember a time when you could go to the polls, vote, and then you would have the results by the time you got back, for, you know, six o'clock, seven now o'clock, like nine weeks. p.m.? Now it's weeks, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the yep. reason for that is because we're, we spend, uh, in some cases, uh, well, I would say that the election cycle for 2024 will start about halfway through 2023. Mm-hmm. In fact, we're kind of already are. This is going to be what I call tilling the fields. It's tilling the fields for what could be plausible for whatever shenanigans that they have planned for 2024. I don't know how it's going to work out, but there needs to be at least a cover story. There needs to be some advertising that are on top of that. The other thing when you're looking at um, when you're looking at climate change, uh, you have to follow the money and see where the Mm -hmm. money is going there. So like, for instance, I I uh, I kind of rub elbows with a a man named Robert Kiyosaki. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the mm-hmm. one of the benefits of all that is I learned about uh, ca- offset carbon trading and how that market is going to be a really big deal coming up mm-hmm. very, very soon. Uh, I also hang out with uh, George Gammon, Ken McElroy, uh, Jason Hartman, and uh, and I get some very interesting financial. I've never been the financial guy, but I get some very interesting financial insights from these guys. And so when I see how they're positioning themselves and you look where the people are, are putting their money right now, mm-hmm. like in, in, in copper, for example, for electric cars, putting it in lead right now for electric cars, that's the narrative to sell you, those things. So how that do you feel about the electric cars? Things. I got to ask. Uh, well, I did a segment on that considering that I live in Reno, Nevada, and we're right by the gigafactory out there, Elon um, Are you into electric cars? Uh, no, but the uh, the my my the guitarist in my band, Trial of Ascension, is a uh, is a management level guy at at Tesla right now, and he has one of the baddest ass Teslas I've ever mm-hmm. seen. And faster than a Lamborghini, thank you very much. I issued a warning about electric cars on my mm-hmm. show the other day, yeah. just alerting people to the reality that the world is getting a little scary and you have a lot of people that are looking to take away people's freedoms. And if you are in an electric car, it becomes really easy mm-hmm. at some point if you have a digital ID uh, for an outside company to maybe turn off your ability to get from point A to point B if they don't mm-hmm. like your behavior in life. So mm-hmm. I, I just issued a warning like, hey, have your eyes and ears open to the realities of the modern world and just know that this digital ID stuff, and we're going to talk about that at the end. I want to ask your opinion about that. So but the, the that's coming. Climate change is the cover story and the tilling of fields and the narrative for control. Yeah, okay. that's right. So the control is this: uh, get an electric car. I, I was I was very upset to find out that they're going to uh, cry. Or was on Dodge is going to uh, discontinue the Dodge Challenger, and I really want a Hellcat, but that this is the last year that I can go and get a Hellcat. So. Um, when I see stuff like that, like you have big companies that are switching over to electric cars, right? You have a uh, bigger company. Like I think it was, uh, I don't know if it was Elon Musk, but someone was talking about like creating these sort of. Uh, these ideal communities out mm-hmm. in like the desert of Nevada, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like you work for Tesla. I'm just, I'm, I don't know that this is actually going to happen, but you work for Tesla, mm-hmm. right? And so you get a Tesla home, you get a Tesla car, you get a Tesla Walmart, no, you. you get a Tesla this. No, and thanks. so it's all, it's like, it's like the, the robber barons of the late 1800s. Like you, you work for the company, you work in the coal mines, but you're also renting from the coal mines and you're all, it's the same kind of principle only in the digital age. You will own nothing and be happy about it kind of thing. With World Klaus, Economic right? Forum. Yep. 
But when you look at like cryptocurrency, I don't know if you've been following the FTX story or yes. any of that stuff right now. I've been doing a lot of, uh, I followed it because the salaciousness of, of SBF and his girlfriend, of course, I was <laughs> yeah. with, with Miguel, you know Miguel, yeah. um, from from uh, from Cultivate Crypto and uh, uh, Dollar Cost Crypto, who is in our same studio in Vegas, by the way. Um, I've done several shows with him about Sam Bankman Freed and mostly from the social, like the red pill aspect of mm -hmm. it. But like, I know enough about crypto to like sort of get myself into trouble. Um, and so when I look at that and I see the potential for crypto to be a form of control, that's when you get like somebody like Gad Saad who says, well, this is the next step towards like, uh, was it social credit system? Mm -hmm. So if, if, right. if crypto is a thing that like say the federal government can control Fed coin, right? If they can control that, they can control your spending or they can see where you're going to go. Mm -hmm. For instance, I think the, the, the trope or the meme right now is the the Fed wants us to report any spending over six hundred dollars. But then there's you've got FTX over here that's like spending tens of billions of dollars mm -hmm. and it's completely unregulated. Yeah, this stuff that's, is it's control. This stuff is is all about control. That's what the mm -hmm. last two years was about in terms mm -hmm. of the lockdowns, the masks. The oh yeah, mandates, okay, all got, of there's that. nothing wrong with the air. Stop wearing the mask. It's gonna be. Really. It's gonna be. Um, the next thing is gonna be carbon emissions. It's gonna be them trying to tell you what to and not to eat. It's gonna mm -hmm. be them trying to tell you to get a new car or not get a new car. And if there's and any mechanism there, that's true. There's if there's any mechanism there via a digital. I, ID some way to monitor you it will be presented we're going to get to this at the end first as a way for you mm -hmm. to monitor yourself everything that can be digital that's exactly will right be will be digital. digital so the idea is how do you escape that horrifying reality and your point about people will do it that's that is the, the thing that's my that's, the that's thing. my wheelhouse right there so that it's like when thing. I see so, when I see people still to this day riding their bicycles through the park with a mask on people will do in it 2022 and we're on the latter half of 2022 that should tell you something about human nature is that that's yeah. how easily like the the real like I remember when when uh, when uh, COVID was first coming out and people started wearing masks or they don't even remember wearing masks you had to wash your hands that was the first step right oh, just wash your hands real good and you'll be okay then it was like okay the gotta masks. put these damn masks on and so from that point you could tell where the who the crazy people were they would be mm -hmm. like in a hazmat suit or something, <laughs> yes, right? yeah, walking yes. their dog in the park Outside. or some shit like that yes. and then everybody became that that person that in there and then now the only the true crazies are still kind of right. hanging on to it but it should tell you something about how easy it is to sort of emotionally like uh, whether it's superstition whether it's emotion whether it's insecurities like mm -hmm. uh you know you need a gas mask right there's nothing wrong with the that's air. i think you where the, the air. that's okay. where the intersection for me became really interesting between politics and the, the masculine feminine issues. Because for me, there was a profound absence of people who were linked to the rational, mm -hmm. who were just linked to the facts, who were linked to that, you know, typically masculine energy mm -hmm. where they're gonna sit back and say, well, that doesn't make any sense, who weren't hardwired to have an emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. It seems like so many people around me, and I was in New York City at the time, just fell in line. They got terrified and they just reacted. They did whatever you said. And I wonder where, where that line would have been to end. I mean, mm -hmm. it was the lockdowns, shut down your business, your family's hungry. It was then it was a mandatory injection. Then what were the, would they not have been willing to do in the mm -hmm. name of, you know, Fauciism, to be honest. So it, it gets very scary. But now we're accustomed, now we're accustomed to, it. to it. So, so and that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. When when 2.0 rolls out, and it will, pandemic 2.0 will roll out. And when that happens, you are going to have a population that has already fallen in line so easily with round one that those people at the top, mm -hmm. you know, the Schwabs, the Bill Gates, whoever They'll they may make be, money off of it. the Fauci's, they will not only make money, but they will know exactly what they can get away with mm -hmm. because they know that they have a heavily compliant population. And my and, and I'm always interested in. The people like us who don't fall in line with that, how many of them are left in the in the in the not land of the free? Not enough to fight back. I'll tell you <laughs> right, that. Right. Not enough exactly. to fight back. And then you have the military, which I believe is largely a tool of the matrix in the modern world as well. So that's another whole problem. And another. You can talk to Mike about that. Yeah. There you go. All right. I'm going to check in with the chat, and then I have a couple more questions for you, Rollo. Go ahead. All right. We have a good amount actually. We got twenty dollars okay. from Pahala Jed. I take everything back. I yelled green on the first interview with Verlo. So much respect for you and your efforts to put a voice to this red pill space. This gives me hope we can return a traditional values respect. Thank you. All right, we got another. Who's tradition? 20 from House of Pain. <laughs> Great show, Jedediah. Bring Verlo back. Totally for equality of opportunity, but not equality of outcome. There you go. And we got one from... Uh, Knock it off, Jack. Rolo, do you have an email so I can formally submit a request to do responses to some of your videos? Oh, sure. You it's uh, rtrationalmail at gmail.com. 
I'm not hard to find. <laughs> I'm everywhere. If I could find him, anybody can. Go Just to say. any of my videos, open the little description. You have to actually click the little show more, then you'll find all there my content. There you go. Info. One from Glenn Lawrence Rollo, educate Jedediah on hookup culture. She <laughs> believes she believes it affects men the same as okay. women. No, not the same. Not the mm. same. That's incorrect. It affects yeah. both, but not the, not the same. There way. is no hookup culture. There is <laughs> no hookup. Go. Well, there is no hookup culture for eighty percent of men. Yeah, and he continues to say, and doesn't realize that women are hooking up way more than men, and that one third of men in thirty are younger, are sexless. That's mm-hmm. true. I, I said that too. You got to go back to my shows, man. GSM. You're missing some. You're missing man, some. Man, th- you got so much mileage out of those GSS days. I can't <laughs> wait for the next batch. I really can't. Any more? Uh, yep. We okay. got um, El Chino. Thoroughly enjoy how these conversations have moved to round tables versus debate-ish. Yeah. Mm. Uh, anime Red Pill. Men are relatively superfluous. She's going to Frank Castle yeah. me off the show anyways. <laughs> So what are you saying, Dr. Phil? Uh-oh. You are superfluous. He superfluous. Can't, superfluous. Perfluous. He can't talk about the All Dr. Right. Phil. Do you know, <laughs> well, I can't talk about this. Do you know what the word superfluous means? Yeah, it depends on context. What does it mean? But like, I mean, the way I understand is like extra. Hmm? Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, good to have around, but not absolutely That's necessary. Right. Well, congratulations. You know more than that uh, daytime shot talk show uh, that I did because that, apparently that's a $10 word and we're not supposed to yeah. use it because people can't understand. There it. you go. Catholic school did something good for me. There you go. Mm-hmm. You got more? Well, that's it for okay, me. okay, cool. I have a question for you, actually, that's been um, weighing on my mind. We could talk about hookup culture, but that's, that's an right. easy one. I think we're going to find ourselves agreeing more on that than anything. But I, mean, I, wanna, I can I, do that in I have five minutes. Here, <laughs> I have you here and I want to ask you something that I've been curious about. If If a young woman, let's say wanted to follow a red pill path let's say Mm -hmm. she's 19 years old Mm -hmm. and she decides that she wants to follow whatever that means to you a red pill path in life i'm going to just say like Mm -hmm. i don't want to say community or ideology or any of those words are going to trigger you but you know what i mean Mm -hmm. what does that look like for her from 19 to say 25 in those years oh man does she go to college does she get a job because there's going to be a period between mom's house and you know your husband's house, mm-hmm. your family's house, whatever it may be, that, you know, mm-hmm. reality bites. Right. Well, <laughs> okay. So first off, if you're 19 to 25 years old, you're already smack dab in the hoe phase. Okay. So you're in, and I'm just saying that not, that's the colloquialism. But what if you're okay? not, you're not, you're not playing that game. Well, you technically are, whether you are or you're not, it's how you contextualize and how well you leverage that is up to the, the, uh, the person in the culture and their had their upbringing and everything else. People say, I didn't have a whole face. No, you did. You just were in a born at a different time or you had, uh, you had different parents. You had, you went, you were Catholic, right? Something, something you, you were still more, you, that, that was the f- period of time where you had the most agency or the most access, whether or not you actually capitalized on that. Oh, so that's know. interesting. You're saying mm-hmm. even people who didn't capitalize, didn't sleep around, had the phase. They're they still just the didn't phase act. They were under, oh, like okay. women. I think on some level of consciousness, women realize that right around 22 to 24 years old is when they are at the peak, they're top of their game, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the, the long and the short of it is, is this. If you're 19 to 25 years old and you want to follow a red pill path, what does the path mean? Because when we say path, and I hate to go all Jordan Peterson on you. What does well, no, what let's, does path let's say, mean? Let's say they, <laughs> they hear this idea of like man being head of household, mm-hmm. Let's say they hear this idea. Is that of- a red pill path, though? Because that's my, my 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 point is is that I think that when we start applying practices to the red pill, then we turn it into an ideology. Okay, then so let's say this. Let me ask it differently. Let's let's there's take, no red pill. Movement. Let's take the red pill out of it, and let's mm-hmm. say there's a young woman who listens, listens to my content, mm-hmm. listens to your content, and says, "You know what? That sounds pretty good to me. Like I want." to be a mom. I want to have a family. I ultimately want a, a husband who is going to be head of household is mm-hmm. going to make the money. And I'm content to either stay home or do a little job on the side that's secondary, but clearly secondary. And that's just what I want. Mm-hmm. How does that person navigate the modern world? Because I think of that and I do get questions like this. And mm-hmm. I frankly, it's 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 challenging to answer because there is going to be a period where you're going to have you're going to be out there kind of looking for that man and trying to see where that matches. And during that period, not everyone's going to be able to live at home with mom and dad. You're going to have to pay your own bills and you're going to have to get that job. And you kind of become immersed in a different path, even if you don't want it as a temporary transition. Mm -hmm. 
how how do you like how do you how does one now like, okay. what would you say to your daughter okay so first and foremost is if you find yourself between 19 and 25 years old i think the best thing you can do is uh there's a concept called grand strategy okay this is very difficult to teach well certainly young people in general but very exceptionally diff difficult to teach young women mm -hmm. because women young women are at the peak of their sexual agency or their peak of their power at that time right mm -hmm. guys want to fly them if, if you're a good looking girl at that that, that during that age guys want to fly you out they want to give you the world is your oyster they want to True. give you that you you get shit for free you get in the club for free you get drinks True. for free you get this you know by by order of degree like how attractive you are and how feminine and flirty you can be i got that thank you very much Didn't huh. give me the dms i know um so at, at, at about 22, 23 years old, you'd be at the top of your game. What you need to understand, ladies, if you're 19, I'll, here's a message to the ladies. Um, if you're in that demographic, see the forest for the trees. Understand and don't let anyone else tell you that you're going to be the same that you are right now at 23 that you will be at 33. Because what will happen is you will be, become a statistic like all the women that I talk to who are 33, 34, 35 plus saying, where's my man? I thought there was Cheryl Sandberg said there's nothing sexier than the nice passive guy who wants who's an opinionated woman with a business and a, you know, an MBA. <laughs> no. The, the 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 long and the short of it is that you have to understand your own nature as a woman and men's nature and uh, and work within that game like play basket or play basketball don't expect the the hoops to be dropped for you just because you hit 29 years old it's seeing the force for the trees it's the grand strategy as opposed to just being right there in the moment and that's i think is the toughest thing to show women right now because we're work uh, it's this distraction economy it's cloud economy but it's also this distraction economy so it's always instagram it's twitter it's it's whatever the the latest thing that's going on and and it's this constant push and pull for attention for women and at that time meanwhile they've got 18 to 28 to sort of make the best of things because the that 10-year window is going to decide how she's going to live the rest of her life up until mm -hmm. she's 80 and i hope you live a long life 80 90 years old right but that window will help you consolidate on your long-term security whether that's emotional whether that's financial whether that's being if you want it I, but rollo i want to be a good housewife and everything I'll, oh you go live in the amish dutch country in pennsylvania okay fine but you have to see the force for the trees and, and seeing it early on. And that's almost impossible to do for young women today unless they have a strong masculine, conv conventionally masculine father, uncle, brother, mm -hmm. some sort of influence who is unafraid to be judgmental. And by judgmental, I mean in the sense that like discerning, understand where you're going, say, look, uh, I see what you're doing. I'm going to tell you what's going on here and take them seriously and take their advice mm. or at the very least have somebody who is not necessarily an authority over you, but somebody whose authority you respect. And usually that should be your father, I would assume. However, we live in a, in a, in a, a social age right now where to be judgmental is the cardinal sin against the gynocracy, against gynocentrism. Because if you say anything that is marginally you know, critical of the, uh, what was it? Oh, did you see the um, the Pierce Morgan interview mm -hmm. with with Andrew Tate? One yeah. of the things that Pierce Morgan says: anything that's against women is misogyny, right? right. Like that. I'm like, Fuck you. It's like get a dictionary, yeah. Pierce. Exa well, get and, a that, dictionary. and that's the thing is like when I see that, that's indicative of what, exactly what I'm talking about. You cannot say believe all women. Don't upset you the can't queen. Say, don't mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Yield to the queen. Yield to the princess. Mm -hmm. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Mm -hmm. And if mama ain't happy, it means God's not happy with you for not performing up to mama's expectations as well. So what's what that does is it creates generation after generation of guys who are walking on eggshells all the time whether figuratively or like literally in some cases they are afraid to say look uh, I know you just met this guy on Tinder and he has a nice private jet and he wants to fly you to Belarus and you want to get on this jet with him and his baby mama and you think it's love at first sight because, you know, he's a he's a Mossad agent and a <laughs> Tinder swindler. right? And if those ladies had had an involved father, an involved uncle yeah. and a, a, a positively masculine guy who says, no, you're not going getting on that plane because you're going to die. He's going to sell you into white slavery or something like that in Saudi yeah. Arabia or something. Right. If somebody there would be no documentary. Mm -hmm. There would be no, mm -hmm. uh, there would be no uh, uh, Netflix special. There wouldn't be, there wouldn't be one, much less nine bank loans taken out to the tune of a quarter million dollars. Had there, that was the first thing I thought. It was like, where is the guy who would step in? And then I thought about it. I go, 
If he did, they would have called him a misogynist. They would have mm -hmm. called him judgmental. Right. Oh, daddy, you're so old fashioned. Oh, but see, that's the problem is you can't step in and say, and guys have to be like unapologetic about this. They have to step in and say, no, you're not going to do that because I care more about your safety than, right. than, you know, you're, you being, you know, feel like your little uh, feelings have been crushed mm -hmm. and you've been oppressed because I'm going to, I'm going to suffer the downstream effects of your decisions because I'm not stepping in mm -hmm. at that point. And I think that when you have a society that is based on this non-judgmentalism, it's all based on emotion, feels, and follow your heart. It'll never lead you astray. And then they end up being like 37, 38 years old. It's like when women are at 18, when mm -hmm. women are at 23, that's when it needs to be impressed upon them that they, that they need to see the forest for the trees and not just be in the battle that they're in right now, but look at the grand strategy for, for the rest of their I'm lives. I'm curious in the That's chat, to too, if you're still in there who asked that question about hookup culture, what do you think we disagree on on hookup, hookup culture? I'm, I'm very inquisitive oh, about it. You do know? Oh, I'm pretty sure. Well, let, uh, let me let me see if they'll answer mm -hmm. because I'll okay. go on to something else. And I'm if you sure. if you can get back to us and tell me what you think we'll disagree on, because I, I don't even know where to go with that question, to be perfectly honest. But OK. I want to touch on something, the good old days. This was really fascinating to me, may or may not be fascinating to you, but there was um, an article. Let me get the article. Where did I put it? Golden I'm always era. disorganized. Why am I so years. disorganized? Okay, New York Post. Here we go. Men were men and women were women. No, no. We this is it. about Hooters. So do you remember when Hooters? Hooters were Hooters. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember Hooters, though? Oh, yeah. All right. So the original Hooters girl from 1983 comes out, starts talking. Her name is Lynn Austin. It's absolutely fascinating. And she starts talking about how she's reliving her glory days and all of that and everything that's going on with Hooters. And they try to recreate the image of the original picture. You can scroll down, Malik, <laughs> and see if you have the original picture down there. So Rolo oh can see. So that's her. Yeah. Yeah. I love right? the big okay, hair. then, then big scroll hair. down a little bit more. You can scroll down and it'll show I think you I knew the. That girl. The, that's her. She was chosen to basically be the face of Hooters. Mm -hmm. So she was on all the Hooter stuff. Girl. Pretty girl. Keep Blonde. trolling down. It's going to show you how they have. Okay, that, those are the, the old Hooters girls. These are oh, pictures of them. God, I love the 80s. The good and 90s. old days. There you go. See? Can and we, I'm going to talk can we about bring this reaction. Back Ginger Lynn, please. And if you keep scrolling, basically <laughs> what happens is you see this is them around the jukebox. These are like the original Hooters girls, which, you know, gives you that nostalgia. I think everyone looks at this who was a lot of It looks like my high time. school yearbook. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And then scroll down. You see the girls who are trying to recreate this now. Mm -hmm. Didn't do it for me. Just yeah. saying. But it's just different. Yeah. It's missing something, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about that because she wound up posting these images. This woman, um, Lynn Austin, wound up posting these images to her Instagram of the old Tudors girls. Mm -hmm. And the comments that rolled in, they can try but won't ever replicate those icons. Those were the good old days. And it's just so many people responded with mm -hmm. like, how I always say, get me in my DeLorean and send me out of here. Mm -hmm. How can I, how do I make it happen? And I'm curious from your perspective, you're one of the few guests, you know, from whatever you want to call it, Red Pill, Manosphere, whatever you want to call the space Those that guys. dating, you're one of the few that like are from an older generation. You are married. Mm -hmm. You've been married for 20, how many years? Six, 26, 26 years. 26 years. But you kind of have a foot in that time, that old oh, time. What yeah. do you think Some it is? Some would say I still have a foot in those There you go, exactly. <laughs> what do you think it is mm -hmm. when people say, particularly guys, when they look at images of women like that, what are they missing about the good old days? Is it visual? Is it, what is, can you put your finger on it? It's perception, it's imagery. I, I, uh, I get this all the time. People like traditional conservatives do not want the red pill. They want a time machine. They yeah. want to go back to the fifties. They want to go back to this golden era that they thought existed and it really didn't exist. That's why we love movies like period comedies or period pieces. Back well. to the future. Have you ever seen <laughs> like on, on HBO, there's a great movie. It's a, a series called Gilded Age. Like no. I watch and I'm it's, it's a total chick movie, but I love watching it because I, they they're so involved and wrapped up in the history and like the carriages and what they wore and all the, and even the, like stranger things though, takes you back to the eighties. Well, that yeah. was me. I was, yeah. the, I was Eddie by the way, just, Oh really? In case you hadn't figured that one out, because <laughs> yeah, I graduated true. in 1986. <laughs> that's true. I, I I was Eddie. I played Dungeons and Dragons. I still play in a. Metal he could band. totally play you in a movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I good. probably still have the do. Uh, you know the 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 the, the vest. Um, but I uh, when when we look back on those things, mm -hmm. we kind of look. I mean, there's the nostalgia. We right. all I love Stranger Things just because I like that was me. I just yeah, exactly. I right. was me. And I'm like, you know, and and my wife and my daughter are like. Yeah, you know, they like roll their eyes, but um, 
when you look at images like that, I think there's this, you know, the nostalgia factor is a reality. It's, it's we want to look back fondly on good memories because we, as human beings, we tend to remember bad things more than we do good things. Mm -hmm. But when we do remember good things, we, we kind of like, I think we kind of like embellish them with rose colored glasses, right? We look back on those right. things. And I think that the problem is, is that um, like I've had this thrown at me uh, a lot of times. People say, well, Rolo, when's the pendulum going to swing back? <laughs> yeah, it's When's not. the pendulum going to swing back to happening. we're going to all go back to mm -hmm. 1950s father knows best uh happening. you know black and white but <laughs> you know that guy i'm like it's there is no it's pen, there's no pendulum that's the problem is thinking that there's a pendulum in the first place you are in the 21st century my friend and things have changed here the, 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 here's the great news though you can go forward you can take a little lessons from the past and go forward and make a better future for yourself. And I hope that you do. God knows I ain't going to be here that much longer. But the it, going forward, there's no there's no going back to the Gilded Age. There's no going back to to 1950s. There's no the nuclear family. We we're, we have question. We had we talk about like oh is Johnny a boy or a girl? You know mm. is is uh <laughs> is oh should we be a, should we be in a poly Should we be poly? Should we be as a poly? It's like yeah. The reason why you're having those conversations right now is because what was marriage that you would love for every mm -hmm. it's a 20th century ideal it's an old order ideal now we're in the we have to deal with the realities of this century right well, now and i'm not saying it's not a bad idea it can be we just have to find some way to reform it and go the, forward and make things the realities better. of this age suck i mean it's they just do. so nauseating at some level the fact that we're even having to have that discussion is johnny a boy or a girl i mean mm -hmm. how ridiculous is it now when i die times. sprinkle my ashes over the 80s <laughs> exactly well let me ask you something though because mm -hmm. it struck me i didn't have this you know that i was set to talk about but when i looked at those pictures mm -hmm. i want to ask you about what's going on with women i in think terms women of... should go back to that hairstyle no though. wait the I, hairstyle... I will, let, me, let me be clear i had it go back to that hairstyle. i'm not gonna lie i had it but i was really really young because i was born in 79 rocks. so i was like you know i didn't 90s were a little less in the big hair skrillex. It was like a yeah, well, it rejects skrillex embrace big hair I had the suede boots in every color. Staten Island, it was it was not a good scene. Mm -hmm. But when I look at women back then, one thing that's really fascinating to me is like the plastic surgery has, I don't know how you feel about this, but the plastic surgery, Love the it. Botox, the fillers, the mm -hmm. hair extensions, the everything has blown up to such a point where like mm -hmm. now it's like everybody's got the same face do you know what a bratz doll is no have you ever seen bratz he'll keep you look up bratz dolls here bratz, bratz dolls? dolls are like they're they, they were very popular i want to say in like the mid 2000s but it's like they're big you know big boofoo lips and little teeny tiny like if a nose at all there you go there's a bratz doll for you yeah everybody looks like that now women have become living bratz dolls but Okay, so I know social media plays some role in that, but it's like mm -hmm. I even spoke to a plastic surgeon at one point. I, I was getting ready to interview him, and he said, I have people coming in here mm -hmm. and saying to me they all want this face, and mm -hmm. it's not only a filtered face, but it's like Kim Kardashian's zoom, filtered zoom face. Zoom dysmorphia. So mm -hmm. I wonder if that also, though, because the truth is when I talk to guys, most of the guys I talk to, they don't like all that stuff. Oh, yeah. So they're like, I don't want fish lips. I, don't, I want your face to move. At what point, I don't want uh, any of that it's stuff. It's like there's this escalation. I can remember like when it when women would shave their private parts, right? That was a niche of porn. Now every you have to. <laughs> right. That's it, right? Right. Or I can remember when women would get like a belly ring, like a right. oh, only strippers get those. That's right. awesome, right? Right. Or uh, or like a tongue piercing or something like that, and then it's nipple. Pier it's like this. Or it was uh, the tramp stamp has now you know the the, t the tattoo across the back is now like the chandeliers yeah. under the boobs or something like that. Like that, it's like this escalation in like okay, well. I'm gonna. This this is how I'm gonna be more attractive and more sexually arousing, uh, and I think certainly it's been exacerbated in the social media era. Mm -hmm. But that's 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 just like female nature and men's nature too. There's always gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna outdo that bitch. So uh, sooner or later, the girl with no tats and no piercings and is all that that's gonna be the hottest piece of ass that yeah. you can get. Well, with I think that's what's happening because though, it's, because it's, I think it's, it's shifting. It's a purple cow uh, uh, theory. Is I think is. that's what's happening. I think that guys are like when guys look at those images, mm -hmm. they even. Even though they're not from the time that you're from mm -hmm. what they see is people that look like real women so you know they're just like you know they they just they all have a different face they all have their own unique personality mm -hmm. their faces move i mean i don't do any of that stuff you know i've been very honest mm -hmm. with the audience too i'm gonna have to just age before your very eyes i'm not doing any of that nasty stuff it's all toxic anyway filters I, the I don't filters do, you I have do on your on, on your real are working on this baby. i do the yes. filter but well i don't done. like <laughs> ever like i can't i'm not doing any of that and i think mm -hmm. there's like 
a, a, a male appreciation for women who just have a more natural everything mm-hmm. because they're inundated. Uh, and I would argue that a lot of these women don't do it for men. They do it for other women. They're competing mm-hmm. with other women in this social media mm-hmm. space. The competition is intersexual competition, but it's intrasexual competition between the men, between mm-hmm. women and women and men and men. Um, do it, guys like it though? Do you think guys right, so have, have, have their standards of beauty changed in terms of um, what they like? Okay, so let's talk about standards of beauty. Men have a much broader, more ver- variety, variety in uh, their uh, ideals for when it comes to sexual beauty. Women have a far more static standard for male, idealized male beauty. So mm. it's always that, it doesn't have to be necessarily like, um, you know, body, you don't have to look like liver king, right? You have to, it's a, <laughs> wow. it's, it's that swimmer body. It's yeah. the, it's a Greco Roman, you know, like you still have to have definition and be muscular, that kind of thing. That has not changed in like millennia. Mm. For for men, if you and if you don't believe me, just go look at all the niches of porn that are, exist on Pornhub. There's, there's blondes, there's work redheads, there's brunettes, there's fat girls, there's skinny girls, there's right. really there's pale variety. girls, really tan girls, black girls, Asian girls, whatever. It's, it's such a it's like a, a buffet, right? right? So men are far more varied in their in what gets them off as opposed to what is uh, physically arousing, uh, ideally for women. But what I what I see as uh, as the co-host for uh, Access Vegas, we've we've uh, we bring in women oh, who yes, are I've, from I have noticed who are from <laughs> Vegas, and that was the number noticed. one complaint we got. How come you guys don't have normal women from like the Midwest who are like soccer moms and forty years old? And and uh, and I'm I'm like, well, we could get them, but you wouldn't watch the show if we did something. Mean, first of all, like, I'll come on; they'll watch the show. You could. <laughs> I, I would be happy to interview <laughs> you, you in Vegas, but it's like there's this, there's well, but even then, what yeah. I've found is like the the guys who are uh, the trolls are going to be trolls no matter what. But people who are in the chat, people are going to be watching this stuff. That's the number one complaint. They have big fake tits. They have big mm. collagen lips. And by the way, the lips. Okay, I I agree. I I don't like the big gigantic you know the bo- boo foo lips, <laughs> but. Um, but like for for you know uh, a bre- I can remember when breast implants were like something of a, like oh strippers get those right now right. it's like it's just something that you, it's like an, it's an investment in your future ladies everybody's um, yeah it's but everybody. there's but there's uh, you know and then there's Brazilian butt lifts and then there's oh it's you know, insane it's like and it's 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 it fascinates me the levels to which that they'll they'll go through this and what you were saying before about. Um, getting uh, plastic surgeons to get mm-hmm. them to look like that that's fascinating because i was i have a, a good friend his name is dr oz he's out of uh, istanbul turkey he's dr red pill in in turkey and he is a uh, cosmetic surgeon mm-hmm. and he practices both in the united states and in in turkey and he was uh, i've done interviews with him where we've talked about what's called zoom dysmorphia have you ever heard of zoom, zoom dysmorphia, dysmorphia. Mm-hmm. no so it's this sort of i guess psychological complex that, that i it probably existed before but like during COVID, everybody was locked down and they had oh, to do yeah. they had to do you know telecommuting and they had to do their meetings via zoom and so what does zoom do not on this camera but it like it will give you like the facial smoothing and you can look better and and uh, and then of course there's filters on there's like a face app there's all kinds of like what Lenza is becoming a big thing right now oh, that too face tune, but it's the yeah face tune and so like crazy. within just like not even you know three minutes you can look like uh, you can look way different you know, much younger than you actually right. are so what happens is that online persona mm-hmm. becomes who you think you are in your head. And so what happens is the you, the women will go to see Dr. O's or any anyone else and they say, I want to look like I like the real me right. that exists on Instagram. See. That I, it takes me five minutes to make me look like that, and that comes back to the Ziggy Stardust uh, principle. And in my fifth book, in uh, in uh, the Player's Handbook, I talk about this: is that we have become the characters that we create for ourselves. Mm online right now and i use ziggy star david bowie and ziggy stardust uh if you're not familiar uh, ziggy stardust was a character that david bowie made for himself for ziggy stardust and the spiders from mars during mm-hmm. i think it was 1974. fantastic album. i highly suggest it but he made this character that was ziggy stardust who was this alien and like literally an alien that came down from wherever and to deliver his message of rock and roll to and people started referring to him as ziggy and he started referring to himself as Ziggy, mm-hmm. and he started to become Ziggy. And later he did a, he, at one point he just killed it and stopped it all together. And later on, Rolling Stone magazine asked him about that, and they said, uh, like, why did you kill off Ziggy? It was so popular, everybody loves Ziggy. He's like, but Ziggy's personality was taking over David Bowie. 
Oh, the wow. The personality, the persona yeah. that, that I created, the character that I yeah. created, I, the personality started to take over my personality. That's where you get Zoom dysmorphia. That's where you get these people who think that the person that they see on Instagram is the real them, right. and they want to they want to make it into the real world rather than the metaverse or whatever it is. And so they tend to believe that their actual authentic personality is the persona that they mm. create for themselves. And then you've got likes and follows and I'm an influencer. And, and yes. so your ego and your self-esteem is built up based on the approval and the affirmation of people you don't even know, probably most of them, you don't even know who build up that and reinforce that character for you to the point where you're like, I want my face to look like how I look on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I want my boobs to look how they look like on Instagram. Yeah, no one's do, including the Kardashians, by the way. They're doing a lot of tricks over there Kill on IG. <laughs> it's crazy what they're doing over there. It's insane. It, it really, Some of these people, these celebrities, because I did work in network, you'll sit in front of them and you'll interview them and you'll be like, they look really weird in person, actually. They look beautiful on Instagram with the filters and all that. And then you sit and you're like, is that a wax face? What's mm -hmm. going on with her I, face? I just, I, re I, re I just reposted this TikTok video and it was this guy and he went and he, uh, you could see it, his phone, There's, the phone's behind you, the, the video's behind mm -hmm. him. He's got this phone. He goes up to these girls that are at the, I, I don't know, the sorority or something like that. Do you have it? Cause, uh, they, oh, no, 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 uh, I'm gonna. Cause they, they he, the guy was going around, he was looking at their Instagram photos and he yeah. went to the Instagram, he'd show the picture and then he would find the real girl right. that was there and, he, and she's like, just this frump, frumpy house frow, you know, crazy. I'm like, yeah. it's And it's happening on the dating apps too. I got a lot of messages from guys that say, I look at this picture on the dating app and I show up at the restaurant and mm -hmm. I'm like, what? Hell no, that's not her. And then you got to sit and they pay for the drink. Well, and they it's do all, never, but it's like, it's like false advertising to the umpteenth degree. Honestly, if you put it into like evolutionary terms, it has never been easier for us to fake uh, yeah. cues, like to fake cues of high value than it is now. That's true. For women in particular, too, because there's a mm -hmm. lot of embellishment that goes on. Like the, like I said, the makeup, it used to just be like makeup. Now it's like the makeup, the hair extensions, the nails, the fillers, the Botox, the mm -hmm. injections. I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Once you, once you open up that, that void, you're just like, wow, that's a, a sinkhole I'm about to fall into. Okay. We're going to check in with the chat and then I have one more topic mm -hmm. for you today. Okay. Let's take a look. Got five dollars from Fur Rose twenty twelve. Jed, when will you bring Whitney Webb to go deep into the Matrix? I could do that. Whitney was on with PBD. I was gonna be on that show, and I had a conflict with my little man. Um, I'll think about it. I will carry on. All right, we got Pat Stebbins Polish passport. Oh, there he $10. is. That's my. That's one of my trolls. Yeah. A woman I know with a large social media presence and famous last name posted on the IG that she's looking for a nanny without consulting oh, with Jesus. her husband or dad. We're gonna go there. What advice does Rolo have for these guys? You're Who's a bad that? mother, Michaela. That? You are a bad mother. Oh no. The Michaela Peterson <laughs> controversy. I don't even oh, wanna God. know. The two you of you are, are just mother. going at it all the no, time. I, the, the, I, it just it just like rubbed me the wrong way that she's like, uh, I, I she gave me all kinds of shit for like saying that she was a good example of the kill to party dynamic. And I don't mean literally kill. I mean like mm. the idea that a child is an inconvenience to mm. uh, women becoming like, uh, famous on Instagram or, or, or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure you've seen these, uh, these uh, award acceptance speeches by like uh, well-known actresses with, a, you know, they got the Academy Award or their Golden Globe or whatever. And like, if it weren't for abortion, I would not be able to have right. this because yes. I would be having, you know, tied down there. That's a really good example of kill to party. What mm -hmm. it means is that those, even the, what was it? Throwing the, the, the baby with the, uh, with yes. the birth control. That's another example of kill, kill to party. party. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is it's like, I'm not done with the sexual marketplace right now, even though I have a child and in, in tow and I realize that it is a net a deficit to me because I'm trying to still like Casey Anthony for example mm -hmm. who by the way has a new documentary out so I got into it with her and it was this sort of back and forth and uh, she's pretty much over the last year proven everything that I said in that video correct as a result of her like trying to you know live this dual life of like being single and then she wants to be married and she doesn't want to be married and then she wants to have a baby and she has a, you know she's already been a single mother to begin with and she was outsourcing her or crowdsourcing I should say her her child care uh, last April and she was doing so on Instagram. Now, I don't know about you. I've been a parent. I know you are a parent. I, my wife would divorce me 
If I went and said, hey, guys, uh, I need a babysitter for Miami mm-hmm. for my, my three-year-old daughter or something, like, just random people like that, that, uh, like, that wouldn't even be a concept in my That's head. That's surprising to me. I don't know her well at all. I've had like maybe and one And again, this has happened her. like several times That's surprising to me only because my concern in doing that would be like, that she probably has fans. She probably has trolls, people who love her, who hate her. Who knows is going to answer that and want to just into your life. She's got the famous dad. Mm-hmm. So that that's odd to and me. And that's for that the other reason. thing that gets me is. I don't know is, why she did it, but that's Okay, was odd so, so, I, so I, and I was joking at the time. Well, I actually half serious because I happened to be in Miami when she was putting that mm-hmm. out there. I said, I said, Michaela, give her to me. I promise you she'll have a great, we'll t- I'll take her deep sea fish and we're going to go hang out. I don't out think with she's going to give gonna, her. No, child it wasn't, wasn't going wasn't <laughs> to have. I told her, happen. yeah, you could come and bring it to me. But um, yeah. so I, um, so, and, and I was halfway joking about that, but then I got kind of serious about it as well. And one of the, probably one of my most heated uh, episodes was when I was saying, where's Jordan Peterson, all of this? Where's the father? Again, as I was saying before, when you said, well, what's your message to women who are 19 to 24 mm-hmm. years old? And that, that when fathers and uncles and positive masculine men mm-hmm. don't step in and say, are you out of your fucking mind mm-hmm. to, 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 to petition and crowdsource daycare? from your Instagram followers? Mm-hmm. How come grandpa doesn't step in and say, no, bitch, you're not doing this? Mm-hmm. How come father does, like the baby daddy, Andre, doesn't come in and say the same thing? How come the new guy that she's with right now, how come he doesn't step in? It's po- maybe come, they do. There's no one that stepped in maybe to say they, maybe jack they do. shit. Maybe they do. And maybe they did, and she's still, and she she's anyway. still I don't know. just That's as recently, uh, just as recently as this month. That's odd to me because that is very risky. Um, that would be my concern. I don't I don't have help other than, you know, mm-hmm. we we. I just I don't, don't just, have any outside such, help, but I understand it's like that an people, alien concept they're very, I, I did this on the show unrelated to Michaela. I don't know her. I don't know what her family situation is. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know anything about her, but, um, except that we had a funny exchange once that she had, was using the wrong focal lens or something on her camera and oh, was yeah. making her look like a fish. So I was like, I got to make sure I'm not doing that on my camera. That's the only exchange I've had, but you know, respect to her for what she does with her content and whatnot. I don't know, but I did on the show cover this outsourcing as a topic mm-hmm. and just how foreign it is to me mm-hmm. and how dangerous it can be essentially to outsource the raising of your children to anyone because Oftentimes, you know, people in in positions of wealth, they, you know, interview the nanny. It's a whole different thing. But that turns it that translates to the average person as like daycare. You know, that child becomes kind of a a, a number in the system Mm -hmm. and they get brainwashed and that's how they just become part of the matrix. So that's always my warning to that. And I always talk about it in in terms of like we used to be a communal society. Mm -hmm. That's stuff that used to happen like grandma and grandpa used to come in and you know aunts and uncles and when mommy and daddy couldn't do it it was family Mm -hmm. it was like but there was a village there was Mm -hmm. a support system there that's not there for a lot of people anymore so now it's just outsourced that was always an uncomfortable model for me um so much so that i never that's why i look so tired everyone i won't get any help but (laughs) i need a filter Uh, no (laughs) joke is there a filter on this damn lens people in audio in the back my my problem my main and i i hear what you're saying i've actually written quite a bit about that but, but it takes a village to raise it, child. Does, that, it does. A, that, that can be a net benefit and a net negative yeah. depending on how you how I you wish my parents it. lived here but the 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 the, the long the, the point I was making yeah. about this is, is know, very similar it. to what you were saying with uh with respect to like uh if you if you want to get rich in this century yeah. sell women FOMO and sell women on the idea that their uh their their time is they have no expiration date and one mm-hmm. of the things uh, unfortunately as i said there's downstream effects as a result of that so again you see gen- a generation i would say of the latter half of the millennials and maybe gen z right now they particularly women if they have had a child they don't think that that should be any hindrance on them being a youtube influencer or whatever it is that they're that they're trying to do and that they can have it they can have it have it all mm-hmm. well the problem is is your responsibility and accountability to that child preclude you doing a lot of shit yeah and sometimes right. that means you don't get to have your youtube show sometimes that means you can't mm-hmm. do those things and I think that when we feed into this, like I was saying, the grand strategy thing mm-hmm. for women who are 19 to 24 years old, part of the effect of that is exactly that kill the party dynamic. I don't have to give up anything because we live in a, in a great gynocentric country that allows me to also have daycare and this and everything and else. Outsource. And meanwhile, she's crowdsourcing it. on. Yeah, Instagram. well, and, the, and the, there's always that 
component for me that when I watch my son, I spend a ton of time with him. My husband spends a ton of time with him. But when I watch him throughout the course of his day, he asks so many questions. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that I'm there to answer them because if I'm not answering them, someone else is answering them. And if mm -hmm. it's a stranger, I don't know what their worldview is. I don't know what their life experience is. You know so little about them. That's the person that's influencing your child the vast majority of the day if you're busy working or mm -hmm. doing this or doing that. My decision was to instead of doing a five day a week show, I do a three day a week show. I, I really limit the work time so that mm -hmm. when my husband's not with him, I'm with him. And like, that's just a choice that I made because I have a deep distrust of the system. And I, and, and I just, I'm not going to just be inclined to just to trust a stranger just because, you know, like, Oh, I pay you. You're on a, you're on a, you're on mm -hmm. a listing. You've been recommended by someone. I still don't know how you see the world. I don't know necessarily mm -hmm. that I want your worldview impacting my son's worldview without really knowing you. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to keep it to the family type. I'm Gen X my... and I was a latchkey kid. There you go. Gen Xer. <laughs> and yes. And I understand what it's like to sort of have like no parent there until six o'clock when my dad got home from work. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I, I get that. I get yeah. the necessity of that, but yeah. on, but, but that taught me a lesson when I became a parent where it's like, I see like certain things like that. I remember like when my, when my daughter got to certain ages, when she was like seven or 12 or, or 16 or whatever, I remember, okay, what was I like when I was 16? Right. right. And I go, there's no way in hell yeah. I would allow her to do the same things that I was like, I, I just took for granted. When My I husband's was already doing that with yeah. the baby and he's only three. So and like, it's, so no to iPad, me, it's like to, as, so, as, as a being a responsible parent, it's like, I would never do yeah. that. But you know, yeah, I maybe you. they're a little more resilient than I give them. I want to, um, do we have more in the chat or, yeah, okay, let's do some in the chat and then I want to get one matrix. And then is there, uh, if, if he brings up the hookup culture again, I'm deeply curious. I'll do hookup culture. We can do that before you go. Okay. We got one from two bit user with emotionalism <laughs> being the driving force of our Western culture. Nowadays, the female vote will always be progressive and mm -hmm. liberal. Yes. That's women true. Control, women decide elections. God help us. Sorry to say, I mean, I, I vote See, conservative, the, but that's the, the, the reality. The Jed of July of this year oh, no, always, might not have said I always would have <laughs> said, I always would have said, God help us. Mm -hmm. I want to maintain your right to vote, but God help us. Could you, ladies, could you just wake up for a hot minute? Did, that's I think what you I would asked me, like, how many women are in the Congress? And I was like, I didn't know what we the We asked what Tyler the at the time, was. actually, and he looked, and he it, looked up it up. By, or maybe Natalia looked but it up. She I'll tell you what, people day. started throwing, like, my guy starts throwing me stats right after that, and they showed the increase in the representation of women, like, since 1971 yeah. all the way up to where we're at right now so yeah. it's, it might not be like a parody but it is spiked yeah. incredibly good you good? good okay good. so i want to just show you um we talked a little bit about this before with the matrix i just want to show you a video um i want the audience to see it you're here so you've got to see it too and we'll just Subjecting. this is this is the slippery slope of what we were talking about before with respect to climate change and just remember that you know the hard left i'm talking to the audience just directly for a second here the hard left always does something for you provides something and says oh this is a way for you to take care of yourself this is your personal responsibility tool that's how it always starts <laughs> and before you know it they're controlling your life you're a little puppet in the system so let's take a listen it's that number 10 the matrix is lying to you about digital id let's look at that tweet pull it up and then we can play it we're gonna have to bump the sound a little louder maybe on that let's check it malik all right i'm just trying to have difficulty pulling up this link at the moment oh really yes it won't pull up huh what is it about? interesting let me just give describe him a it to me. yeah i can describe to you it's basically a guy from the world economic forum and it's he's essentially, it's not Klaus. <laughs> <laughs> I had enough of him, to be honest. It's basically Klaus. him. Is that it? Klaus. Oh, that's you. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, where did that come from? Yes. Um, it's from, Jay do you know James Melville? Not German, do you follow James Swedish. Melville? He's a cool guy on Twitter. He posts a lot of this stuff. A guy from the World Economic Forum comes out and he's talking about your carbon footprint and how the World Economic Forum wants to be involved in creating this device, mm -hmm. digital of course, where you can then track your own carbon footprint. Mm. So if you're worried about the carbon footprint that you're putting out on the world, you can say, oh, how many miles did I drive today? Oh, what did I eat today? And it it, it actually mm. digs into every aspect of your life. The food you eat, the car you drive, so how much mileage. So it's like a for your right. <laughs> but carbon but footprint. But don't get it wrong. He's doing you a favor because he's providing, and this is just for you mm -hmm. to track your own. And I just say to the audience. Now you can that, wear two Apple Watches. That very quickly turns into then. Mm. I would love to know where does that information go? go who sees it who stores it who's monitoring it mm -hmm. and just think about that think about how easy it is that for them at the top mm -hmm. to then sit and say oh look these people are uh, a, a, um, a, a drain on the system so maybe this guy over here shouldn't be driving so much let's just turn his car off 
let's just prevent him from doing that. Now you got an electric car that works into the system quite nicely. Don't you see how that goes? Or this person over here, maybe we need to send him a message that he's eating too much meat. He's going to the store and I see these purchases racking up of beef and those cows, when they fart, it's a problem, oh my God. you know? So, and it's no joke. I mean, people think Colon the conspiracy theories of yesterday are becoming the realities of today. Mm -hmm. So this was just an interesting video that showcased that. We don't have to I show would the argue video, this. I would argue this, uh, that, that those decisions that you're talking about, well, he's eating too much meat. He's doing this. Like, mm -hmm. They will not be made by a person. They would be made by an algorithm. Mm. It will be artificial intelligence. There will be an algorithm that says, if you are doing this, then you default to this. It turns off your car. That's the result of it. Yeah, it won't, it like, won't even be a backspace. It yeah, won't even be a human that is making that decision. Who, who, it will be an algorithm. Oh, a human's always going to be at the top. Well, there's going to be a chain. human writing the algorithm. That's right. But And it, who is yes. it going to be? It's going to be the World Economic Forum. Yes. I and mean, we showed the videos on here. You quoted before. You said, you know, oh, you have no money. You have no property. And mm -hmm. you'll be happy. You have nothing. And you'll be happy. That comes directly Eat from drugs, the WBF. Live in a pod. Eat bugs, you know, don't own any land, have this electric car that we can turn on and off at our convenience, make sure that you check in with your digital ID so we know if you're behaving. Here, how, I mean, how long, let me, here's the hypothetical here. How long do you think it would be before that algorithm or that system or the matrix says, okay, here's your wife. Oh here's yeah. Your, here's your, here's your girl. Right. Here's a girl for you. Right. Like we need you to have babies right. because we like you, you're valuable. So we need you. And the algorithm says you need to reproduce. Here's your wife or wives. Mm, interesting. Interesting. Although I do believe that part of the golden matrix is to depopulate. So, well, yeah, for certain undesirables yeah. and people, you know, listen, you can call me a conspiracy theorist all you want, but you also called me a conspiracy mm -hmm. theorist when I said that, you know, Joe Biden was going to be involved in a vaccine mandate and you were going to have companies telling you you couldn't show up to work the next day unless you got an experiment. They were right. Shot. He wasn't involved. So. There's no, he's not involved in anything. The guy oh, he's, the, no, no. is cognitively not there. He's, the people who are, right. are his handlers The administration involved, is, though. And yeah, I don't know if you saw, we covered also, did you see the Twitter files and all that stuff that happened on Twitter where they uncovered that Twitter had actually involved, be involved in the suppression of the yeah. Hunter Biden oh, yeah. story? Yeah. So all that, you know, we talked about Tate and Sneeko and mm -hmm. all these guys that were removed. This is all, y'all better wake up. I'm telling you at home my if father, you're not alert to My this. father died from uh, complications of uh, Alzheimer's dementia. I dealt with it for about mm, 10 or 12 years before he passed. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden displays every single, you know, There's characteristic of somebody in cognitive decline. Can we at least call a spade a spade? Can we at least admit that? I hate it when people go, well, Joe Biden says this and this. I'm like, he's not he's saying it. anything. He's not doing anything. Yeah. He's not driving. No one's driving the bus. Okay. Someone's driving the bus, just not him. It's not him. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So cocoa culture, where do you think, I want to get to this because I don't, <laughs> what do you, do you think we disagree on some components? I don't, uh, maybe just like the details. I don't know. No. I don't think that we necessarily. So my disagree. take on it is this, mm -hmm. um, cause that whoever that was in the chat was wrong. I, I actually just feel like it's bad for, it's, I, I argue a lot that it's bad for women. I'm trying to tell women don't do this because it leaves you down a dark path. A lot of women are traumatized as a result of hookup culture in a way. I think that men aren't necessarily traumatized emotionally from it for women. I think it's just a dark hole of wasting time, mm -hmm. delaying those years where you could settle down with someone that really matters. You wind up with a ton of emotional baggage and a lot of trauma that you don't need. And because you you are happier when you're pairing sex with emotion, you're depressed nine out of 10 times when you're living in that environment. You know, you're sleeping with people. They don't call you the next day. You're depressed. You, th you're that leads churn. to drinking, antidepressants. I mean, it's just a dark downward spiral for women. When I talk about it with relation to men, it's a little bit different. I don't talk about it from the perspective of emotional trauma. I don't know that men experience emotional trauma from sleeping with people that they don't love. But I do talk about it as it being a sinkhole where then it becomes like, oh, you know, people, they, they get, you know, upset because I didn't, it becomes like a tally. Like how many girls can I get with this week? Oh, I didn't hit the mark. That's a problem. They start like falling into the drinking, falling into the club culture, losing focus, losing ambition and focus on what they should really be doing, which is like becoming that financially secure, financially stable, healthy, you know, in the gym, fit guy who looks to a woman like a reliable source to lean on. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just a sinkhole in different ways for both. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want guys like I'd rather I don't know if you, you follow the Belmars, I guess, right? And like how, do you follow them a little bit? And how they, no? Okay. Well, Belmars. we won't use them as, a, as an example, but. Is that a, is that a TV show? No, 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 no. But I'm trying to just pull people from potentially the space who are like not necessarily involved in the 
Um, like what Michael Sartain said yesterday on your podcast with uh, Waller, where he was like, we got enough. What did he say? We got enough. Uh, Are you stalking Jason or Justin Waller? No, no. I watched your, it was for, it was actually, <laughs> if you want to know, research. Okay. if you want to know, it was or research Jeremy for is probably today. Watching, right? It was Jeremy, not mm-hmm. me. And it was research for today. I wanted to see what you guys He's were talking about last pressure. night, mm-hmm. but no. <laughs> but it was, um, what is you guys were tr- talking about, there's enough like playboys in that mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. And I just tell guys like, don't don't do it. Don't don't get immersed in hooking mm-hmm. up with people that don't matter. Well, it's just gonna take you off okay, your mission. Okay, so first of all, I think the the term hookup culture is uh, it's it's nonsense, and I've been saying this really since about 2012, but uh, I think it's more pronounced right now, 10 years later. The reason I say that whenever you put the word culture after any other word, you make it endemic. So if we say it's rape culture, it's marriage Mm. culture, it's bro culture, it's this culture, that immediately is like sort of like sends up a red flag for me. It's like, why are we calling it culture? Do you think that everyone is doing this right now? Because when you say that, whenever I hear hookup culture, it's nine times out of 10, it's coming out of the mouth of a woman who can't find the guy. I go, well, you know, hookup culture did did this and did that. I was just doing a a breakdown video of Mia Khalifa, uh, like a porn star, Mia Khalifa, who now suddenly I don't even know who that is. uh, I didn't until, I didn't (laughs) until, thanks guys for the reference, (laughs) by the way, yes. but uh, there's there's a, a like a slew of porn stars right now who are getting out of the industry like Mia Khalifa, Lana Rhodes, Riley Reed, and then what was the other one? Oh, uh, Andrea Chechik, I think. Mm. They're all gonna, and of course now, of course they're they're past their prime, right? They're in the the 29 to 33 demographic, mm-hmm. and they're just you know. But it's all about like the the evil of the porn industry that pretty much sustained them, and still they still keep their porn names after 18 to 28, and they're cycled out, and now the new crop comes in. And so when I'm looking at women saying, oh, it's hookup culture, it's something, it's something that's outside of themselves that put them into the condition that they're in at that particular time. So when I look at hookup culture, I say, I have to put it into perspective of evolutionary psychology and a red pill perspective as well. 80% of guys are sexless. They're not getting, they're, they're unattractive, let's just say. And I say they will be that way for life. They're not perma virgins. I'm just saying that they're 80% of guys are deemed as unattractive. Mm-hmm. Dr. David Buss talks about this, Steve Stewart Williams, Rob Henderson. There's all kinds of data and not just the data clism stuff and not just the online stuff, but there's, there's multiple sources for this. Women rate 80% of men as unattractive. That does not mean that 20% of men are attractive. It just means that they'll do. Okay. Of that 20%, only four and a half percent of men, the Justin Wallers of the world, are attractive enough for women to want to initiate any kind of contact with those guys. So that's how we do dating today is on Tinder, on Hinge, on Bumble. If you don't believe me, you can I can show you the stats where we look at like how people meet their mm-hmm. spouse or whatever. It's It used to be church, it used to be school, it used to be work, it used to be friends, it mm-hmm. used to be all, like all these things are in a, a constant decline. The number one way, if you look at the, at the stats that spikes is on meeting, meeting your spouse or meeting a girl online. Now, the problem with that is, is it's all, it's gone from being this, uh, it's gone from being like, okay, Cupid, where we're going to write this really involved like profile about ourselves and like, oh, I really like long walks on the beach and coffee and I like dogs and rainbows and shit like that <laughs> to I'm just going to swipe left or swipe right. It's all perceptual okay. at this point, right? So is he hot enough for me to want to get to know? Swipe this way, okay? So you've got four and a half percent of guys and then you've got the entirety of women who can still at least compete be attractive enough to compete at that level to to be in the running to be in the sexual marketplace getting after it with the four and a half percent if there is a hookup culture it exists between a very small percentage of men and a wide percentage of Mm -hmm. women whereas these the rest of the guys are the have-nots the 80 percenters that are the have-nots that's why i say that there is no hookup culture because it seems like the way that it's represented and the way that it's pitched is that all guys can get all girls. They're all, oh, they're just so cruel. And they they just care. All they care about is quick, fast sex and everything. Whereas the 80% of guys are so in such a state of sexual scarcity that they would bend over backwards to be in a monogamous, a good, like we were saying before, uh, the 19 to 24 year old girls who want to be at home and want to be a mom and everything else, those guys would bend over backwards to get into something like that, but they're unattractive and they're not going to get the call. To me, it so, seems to me that there is a hookup culture when it comes to women though. Yeah. There are, I mean, oh, we, yes. we show and videos. And four and a half percent of guys. We show mm-hmm. like videos constantly of, and mm-hmm. the reason I showcase them is because I want 
people to understand what a modern woman is saying. Like, let it come out of her own mouth. And they'll say, oh, my body count is, I don't know, 15, 16. I don't know. I lost mm-hmm. track. <laughs> you know, in and out of jumping in and out of bed with different guys wearing it as a badge of honor. And it just mm-hmm. seems to me increasingly normalized. So that tells me mm-hmm. that there is a hookup culture when it comes to women, which is a problem. Most of those women, I would be completely okay saying are going to wind up looking back on those years and regretting them they're going to feel like they didn't get anything out of it except pain trauma wreckage Mm -hmm. they wasted time all of that stuff even if you're talking about a small percentage of men and i agree with you because there's a lot of men that are sexless they're Mm -hmm. depressed as a result they're looking for a partner they're not getting it they're not engaged in that hookup culture 100 percent. even for that small percentage of men who say say they're really good looking maybe they're in really good shape whatever it is high value whatever it is Mm -hmm. i would still say that it's a waste of your time to engage in that because ultimately you could be better directing you're sharing the apex alpha yeah and you could be better directing your attention to real goals a or if you really care about a high value woman and your goal is really to land with a wife who you know has that purity that you claim you like and has all these attributes that you claim you like why are you messing around with these girls that you know you're not going to take seriously at the mm-hmm. end of the day it's just a it's a time sink oh, everybody's for looking for the, they're all looking for the unicorn they're all looking for the the girl in the sun hat or is it just dress. like an instant gratification culture now though that's well, just and like that's I, and that's what, what the point i was going to talk about is like what we have gotten to the point right now with tinder hinge bumble with apps it's no longer like online sites it's apps now and it's all perception based and it's all for the for the most part, women are doing the selecting. Who are on those apps now? Mm-hmm. Um, women would I would and this is just me spitballing here, but I would argue that women today would much rather have a you know somewhat good looking guy come up and approach them live in real time rather than like you know left swipe left swipe right. Um, but we are in such a perceptual we we've conditioned ourselves to be so sensitive to perceptions. Like I said, they had the face apps and Lenza right. and stuff like that kind of stuff. Where we're seeing we're we living a we have a digital consciousness right now, and we have our regular like right now. I'm talking to you in the real mm-hmm. time. This is our mm-hmm. consciousness. Then I have like sort of my inner dialogue, which is this consciousness. We now have de- developed a uh, a digital consciousness on top of that that becomes that personality. But when when we're looking at uh, say like Tinder and Hinge and Bumble. I don't think that enough people realize that you are wrapped up in what's called churn marketing. It is not in Tinder's best interest for you to find a long-term, satisfying, That's wonderful right. relationship that you, to last the ages, right? It is not in those, the, the, the online dating communities, mm-hmm. whatever, interests for you to be happy in the long-term because they lose a customer. If they were that good at like pairing people up, here's your soulmate, <laughs> like eHarmony, right. right? If they were right. so damn good at that, mm-hmm. it would kill the business because now, now that you've met, you're out of the system. So what happens is it's churn. They want you to have shitty, long, a short term, quick hit, you know, ejaculate and evacuate um, uh, <laughs> re- a relationships, short term relationships. One. That's what they want. Sorry, sorry, John, from our life dating. I stole that from you. Um, but they. Um, That's two lines you stole. I, the show. But I have attributed both of them. Um, so. When when you're looking at churn market, we we don't know. Like t- I was making this point on yesterday's show, we don't know how to watch a movie anymore because right. we watch series. It's net, what Netflix series, and we get all pissed off and upset that like Ozark season three is over, and I got to wait I a year it. for uh, for the next season, mm-hmm. right? Because you'll sit there and you'll commit eight to ten hours to a season of a particular show that you mm-hmm. like because at the end of each one is a cliffhanger and it brings you back and it's like the Breaking Bad formula. It brings you, how are they going to get out of this one, right? It's the same thing with Tinder. It's the same thing with our, really with our political process too. It's the same thing. Like think of all the ways that we uh, keep people involved in the churn going over and over and over again. And I think it's really dangerous, by the way, to be in a churn that is going to have long-term effects on your on your sex life, on long-term mm-hmm. effects on your marriage, long-term effects on the children that might be produced as a result mm-hmm. of that. Um, and so, I think it's imp- you want to hear, here's here's your advice for the ages. Here is is understand when you're in a churn. Uh, the easiest way, to, of course, is like look at Netflix and and all that kind of stuff. But um, we we have fundamentally changed the way that we think about each other, and we fundamentally changed the way that we've been like sort of allowed things to influence us or mm-hmm. what we're entertained by, because we want to stay in that churn. We we like it. Human beings love the churn. It's like it's uh, it's engineered gambling addiction is what it is. That's so it's right. like what did you, oh what did uh, what did she say about oh that bitch she said this about me on well, Twitter you love the on churn Instagram because all the chemicals mm-hmm. get released oh, that yeah, get it's you a excited. Dopamine. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so it's a there's, there's a yeah, there's a biochemical and they study aspect that. They well. study that. And I, I wrote a book about this as it relates to humanity and how we react to stimuli. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting how all the tech executives and Silicon Valley go and they hire these behavioral psychologists mm-hmm. and they study how to get you addicted. So even if you're somebody like me who's fighting against the matrix and fighting against robot culture, at some point you're like you're a little bit of a robot too because I also am waiting for the next season of Manifest and I'm very angry and very upset that it's not there. Manifest. And you got to check. Is that your group? I love that you show. Love that. Oh, Dude, really? mm. I love that Ozark's show. Ozark's over. I can't watch it. <laughs> I love that show. It's a good show. I do watch Handmaid's Tale too. Oh I know my that's, God. I do. You know what's I funny do. is that show, I remember when that show came out and I, I would just hack it up in disgust. And I remember when <laughs> Ruth Bader Ginsburg died and like all, everybody was dre- like all these women were Dressed, dressing up in yes. the, the, the outfits and the frocks yes. and all that stuff. Yes. And you know what? It had a real spike in popularity this year because of the election cycle. And like mm. I said, it was like this. It was till in the fields. Yeah. Man. It's a bit of no- it's a bit nauseating at times. I mean, that I will admit there's it's you know, this wokeness is just woven into so many television shows. It plays that- on fear. Well, and it's on also a like fundamental fear for women, an existential It's also fear like I watch stuff and I can appreciate it, and you're 20 minutes in, and then you're like, oh, why did you have to do that bit about a, va- a vaccine? Like right in the middle of my pleasure, mm-hmm. you have to interject your political talking point, or there'll be something where they'll reference someone that you know looks like a Republican, you know, and or you're the like, unnecessarily Come on, gay character, it's like it like, does nothing to the plot. It's like, it's, okay, it's oh, like fine, thanks for throwing forced, us a bone. Forced like wokeness everywhere, where you, where you have to like, you can't even sit through an hour movie. Sports have been destroyed you can't even sit through a, a, a basketball game without politics being injected in mm-hmm. something it's nauseating it's and it's funny that clip with megan rapinoe the other day to wrap up she had mm-hmm. said something about how like it's not my job to be talking about all of this stuff but i have to be out there and i wanted to tell her honey nobody wants these people in sports talking about politics we just want to go like the good old days like we mm-hmm. had and you go to, and you watch a football game or a basketball game and for that's your piece you don't have to be having the woke mania coming in your face every well, angle but it's, it's everywhere, it's, uh, man. It's, it's everywhere. Feed them fear and sell them security. Yeah, that's, that's right. Fear is the weapon of choice for the current times. And I think they realize that an exceptional number of people are afraid. That's the one area when Andrew Tate was talking about it that really piqued my interest when he was talking about how fear is used as a weapon and how young men in particular who don't play into that and who aren't bought and sold by that fear are the target of the matrix because they're the only ones that are going to be on the front lines resisting that stuff. I think that's one of the things that really turned me on to what he was saying at large Mm -hmm. was like, this guy gets it. This guy gets why he's been targeted and why people like him have been targeted. And he's trying to tell people out there, don't become that tool. You know, if you don't know who the robot is, the robot is you wake up. Um, So I appreciate that. that, You know, it's the, uh, it's actually the definition of marketeering is to create the problem that you exclusively have the solution to and you sell the solution. So you are both the source and the solution of the problem. You're always going to profit. That's right. One last check in in the chat before we go. Yeah, there's a few more. Okay. So we got $5 from Manasseh. There's, $5, come on, man. Give yeah. me the $100. <laughs> there's no such thing as my truth and your truth. There is only the, the truth. truth. Mm-hmm. Christianity and Islam cannot both be cannot be both be true. Jesus is the only way into heaven. Oh. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. Uh, you guys don't have a stream deck yet. I need, I know. You need like I need buttons. Rocks. I thought about that the other day because I was watching a clip of Fresh and Fit. Um, and he had like a button to press. And I said, I need one of those. I'm going to go to Best Buy, grab one, and come back for Adam's show and give you a stream. <laughs> I love it. It's only 150 <laughs> All right, got another one from KS, $5 again. As a man, I like woman that is not only ugly, but not excessive beauty, just mm-hmm. homely. Plastic surgery, the lips are not fish, it is duck. Oh, it's duck lips, that's true. Mm. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, I can't. I can't get behind it. I can't get behind it. What, okay. uh, when, when did that become popular? Like, can somebody explain to me, like, wh- wh- and wh- in what way is that supposed to be attractive to guys? I like, don't know. And I, I have not, of all the things that women do, that is the one thing that universally. What happened to the classic Cupid? You have Cupid's arch, actually, the the, the, the classic. Yeah, I have the, that the little, yeah. Lip. But I don't They're, have big lifts. I no, don't no, have, no, like, don't have I don't have, yeah, I don't yeah. have anything going on. People can see my face moving. And it's always funny. I always tell God ladies. Damn Kardashians. I say to them, though, because, <laughs> you know, you see the ladies with the frozen. And I say, ladies, you're. You're giving your age away because mm-hmm. look at a young face. Young faces move. They move. The second you're frozen, everybody knows that you're not only older, but you're insecure about being older. Instead, just embrace that shit. With age comes Embrace wisdom. the suck. With embrace age, the... Listen, my smile lines make me smarter. I'm just saying. Okay. All right. We got um, one from Thomas Vandenberg, $5. Was the 1950s truly oppressive to women? Or was the real issue is that women's hypergamy wasn't fulfilled due to marriage and monogamy? 
Mm-hmm. We gave them everything they wanted. The surest way to make a woman miserable is to give her everything she wants. Oh, men too, I guess. But like, yeah. understand. Human nature, I think. Oh, well, we've got a washing machine, a dishwasher. We've got this and this. And like, you give, give you everything that you want. Yeah. So, then you become bored. Yeah. Boredom. Boredom is <laughs> nothing it, worse. Uh, uh, against boredom, even the gods struggle in vain. There's nothing worse than a guy who bores you. Mm. You know, there's guys on paper that everything's there, right? On paper, all the boxes checked, but you, you're not exciting. You sit with not them taking your rock climbing. You, you sit not there Not skydiving with that dude. You're like, you're done. Mm-hmm. No matter what happens, this, you can't make it work. I told same. my wife that too. I remember when we got married, I said, I can't guarantee you I'll be a millionaire, but I will guarantee you that your life will never be boring. And there you I have go. kept that promise for 26 <laughs> years. <laughs> she's like, maybe she's probably watching. Hey, you know what I'm talking she's about. She's probably like, maybe you could be a little boring every now and then, Rolo. Just to, <laughs> just to the accelerator out. until the car runs out of gas or I slam Listen, into the you're wall. you're not easy. So <laughs> pa- more power to her for dealing with you. Go ahead. I mean that in a nice way, but you know, you're a big personality. No Try question. <laughs> All right. We got 10 pounds from hollow band. Dang. Hey Rolo, am I wrong if I say many women try to hold the frame in a relationship in fear of being left behind slash alone as most masculine women, women as most masculine men tend to be lone wolves. Uh, I don't know. So no, I wouldn't necessarily say that most masculine men are lone wolves. I think what I think what he's trying to do is try to make a case for the Sigma male. Really go look at uh, Vox Day's video on uh, sociosexual. You should probably watch it too. Sociosexual hierarchies. It's like the alpha, the beta, the delta, the gamma, the omega. And everybody wants to say, well, I'm a Sigma. I list, I'm outside of all of that. Like, yeah, you're a maverick, dude. Um, but uh, the idea that uh, that men and women both want to like have some sort of like internal power struggle, and I mean it, to an extent it is, but I think that the, one of the reasons why there's uh, sort of a vying for authority in relationships mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to women, it's because women have a longer uh, a longer period where women need long term security, mm-hmm. and so that that if you look at like eighteen to twenty eight, like uh, right before what I call the epiphany phase. That's when the narrative sells women on the side. Feed, fear, sell security, right? So the security in this case is get to college, get your shit together. You can be an astronaut if you want to. <laughs> um, and all you can be anything. You, you can have a baby and you can do this stuff too, right? It's because you can't trust men. And by the way, that, that, uh, this is a perfect way to end this show. That, uh, the, the suffragette list that you showed me at the very beginning of this mm-hmm. show all of those those reasons you will hear women reiterate today you can't trust men they're either homer simpson they're ridiculous they're 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 goofy dumb doofy daddy Fat, that needs dumb, mommy useless. to like yeah. save him from himself yeah. yep. or else you're a borderline abuser so you're 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 just this side of tinder swindler you're just this side of like the be all getting smacked around right or you're in, and for this generation, you're incompetent. You don't know how to drive a stick shift. You don't know how to change a tire. You don't know how to tie a, a mm-hmm. tie to go out to a formal affair, that kind of stuff. And usually fat, by the way. That's what Just women, saying. ladies, that's what you get to choose from. Mm-hmm. You get asshole abuser, you get doofy daddy, or you get incompetent yeah. millennial. What? Do you, which one do you want? Oh, well, of course they say, well, I don't want any of that. So I'm going to get my own business. I'm going to get my own career. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get my own education. I'm going to do it because I can't trust any man with my life. I can't trust I got him that to message. Be I mean, so, even 20 yeah, years ago, I think we ago, talked about that, that in one of our episodes. I got that too. messaging. Yeah. I, I was very much, you know, and even it, it's crazy. Like when you talked about having that feminist lens mm-hmm. because you grew up in the time, I never really thought about it that way. But I, I went back and I, I, I absolutely internalized some of it. You know, you, mm-hmm. you can't help it. You're existing in the world. And I remember hearing from multiple sources, both men and women, like you can't trust guys. So you need to have your shit together. You mm-hmm. need to make your own money because you never know if someone could leave you in the future. I mean, that was just over and over and over again in my mm-hmm. head. So I can sit here and say it didn't play any role in the decisions I made, but odds are it did play some role you in the decisions had, I made. You had real femme sapien. Uh, Allie Drummond was in yeah. here. And she went viral with that one video, a TikTok video where she yeah. was saying, I defer authority yes. to my husband. With yeah. Pearl, she was in that and, video. Yeah, thing. and the, the number one like come back I mean, like that hundreds of thousands of comments the number one comeback was well you can't trust him he's gonna go bang his secretary you can't right. trust him you gotta have money you gotta have your own bank account girl right. what's you're gonna be left ass out it's like it's like 1930s depression era like alimony like, <laughs> yes he's gonna yes. leave you for a hotter girl barrel. yeah and it's and so that that yeah. fear 
is what prompts women to say, well, I have to take care of the beta mm. buck side of hypergamy right now. And so I've got to have, I got to be a protector, provider, and parentally invested. Yeah. And I have to become the man that I wanted to marry. Yeah, because if I don't, I'll be ass out when the guy that I am yeah. with goes and bangs his secretary. That's, that's a real message that comes through. That's and it fear, also comes through in schools. I remember I had security. a couple of teachers, um, uber feminists mm -hmm. and I went to Catholic school actually for 12 years but mm -hmm. in my high school there were like two uber feminists mm -hmm. and they were not apologetic about it at all I mean borderline man haters like didn't not only like hated men but kind of hated the traditional family structure everything mm -hmm. that it represented and we knew that but we were young and it was an all-girls high school and I remember kind of having those debates with her in class actually mm -hmm. it was a pretty active debate our politics were very different she was hard left I was conservative so we, those debates would happen like for the rest of the classroom to see and even though I was on the other side of the issue because that's really how I felt I still would hear what she was saying some of that got in you know you mm -hmm. I, I know it just because I look at like the next 10 years of my life and I'm like wow maybe this is why I did this, or maybe that was just playing in my mind and I didn't even realize it. You do just internalize stuff that yes. you don't even realize. No, no one's an island. You're gonna get influences from, That's true. from the culture, very, from your religion, true. from your parents. I mean, you think about the That's things that, true. the values that you have yeah. were developed by someone else that you absorbed at some, somewhere I know. along the way. I, I, um, I was just, I was recently watching, I think it was a Chris Williamson video or something, we were talking about complaining about the red pill and guys such as myself, I say my name, um, <laughs> complaining about how, oh, there's nobody on in the sphere that's really talking about relationships. Dude, I have written books about relationships. I've written books about how to apply red pill, mm -hmm. and print, for lack of a better term, red pill uh, intersexual dynamics to relationships. And one of those is how to raise children, mm -hmm. you know, the positive masculinity, my third book, how to raise boys and daughters mm -hmm. from a red pill paradigm and under the first lesson is understanding exactly what you just said which is you you picked up this this feminism somewhere along the way yeah. like whether it was in catholic girl school or it was like from uh from a popular song maybe madonna taught you feminism or or beyonce yeah. or something like that you madonna. picked it up from a movie mm -hmm. or a movie or a, a music or something yeah. maybe you read something and again it's not like it's not like you had to read like the feminist manifesto and like okay i'm a feminist now that's not what you did it's just like a little by little by little by little oh yeah and i even and went to college i mean my main teacher I, she was my advisor for my you know honors thesis mm -hmm. and she was my spanish literature professor super feminist and like i can remember now writing papers on like the female gaze and like mm -hmm. i just go back and I, I i think about it all and even though i was just i was kind of removed from it in the sense that my politics kind of guided a lot of how i viewed the world so i had this sense of like what morality meant to me. I came from a really good family that was grounded in family values and all of that, but it didn't matter. I still mm -hmm. entered, I dipped my toe into that water and I'm sure, you know, my toe was wet when it came out, you mm -hmm. know? So that was an interesting thing that happened for me in our exchanges where mm -hmm. you had said that and I actually went back and thought about- Everyone's a feminist. If you're born that, after 1966, yeah, you're crazy. a feminist. Or you've had feminism in some way influence yeah. the way that you think about the world. Well, I wanna thank you. It is sure. always a pleasure to have you here, to be in person. You have have your wedding ring on. I do. I, no, I the have wedding my, ring? Where's the no, wedding ring? I have. Come on, come okay, on. listen to what happened. This is my audience. I've had Felbin on it. This is my engagement ring. My oh. wedding band, the diamonds keep popping out. My husband took it in. We got picked it up. Another diamond popped out. So you know what he's doing now? My amazing husband that I love with all my heart. He's getting me a new one and he's taking mm. the diamonds from my original ring and making a little charm for me for Christmas. Oh. So I don't have it, but baby, I love you. You know, you're my rock. You know, <laughs> you're my sexy. I love it. I struck old, man. I got to mm. say, being married uh, being married has been and I, I know you probably feel this way too it's just been the best experience of my life in many ways so um get married people to the right person don't Men just get married women are to get better married. together than we are that's apart. right we compliment we each other natural innate compliments right. to one another you can't say that rollo we're gonna get banned <laughs> the secret to a healthy life is to have polarity between yourself that's and right. your wife well thank you you are a pleasure to talk to mm -hmm. all the time thank you for making me think i know sure. we don't always agree and you i know have come sometimes... a lot you know what i say you have come a long way yeah and i you know have come a long way in a very short listen, time. listen i know you sometimes get on the podcast and i know you got a rip jet a little bit but i know you love me deep down inside don't worry I, I rip I, 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 I rip because I care. <laughs>
I know. There you go. Listen, you know above all else that I'm somebody who I'm does, invested in your growth. I listen and I absorb and I'm honest about, you know, the discoveries I make along the way, which I think truly is like all you can ask in a human. Sure. So thank you. Have an Anytime. amazing. Oh, you want to plug something? Tell me. What oh, you I want to plug uh, Access Vegas, which is my new show that uh, we are doing bi-monthly. The next one will be on December 15th. It's on my sh it's on my channel and it's on Mike Sartain's channel right now. Coming in January, we've got a lot of changes coming up. We're going to do a dedicated show, our dedicated channel mm. for Access Vegas. But right now you can see the shows on my channel and his. We mirror them. And then, uh, so that'll be the 15th. And then on the 30th, we're doing a New Year's Eve show in Vegas of all places. Oh, um, so we'll be doing that. It is a, it's a, a, a panel show, but it's like, it's a lot more intimate, I guess. And we're trying to, I, I'm, I don't say raise the level of the conversation, but it's like, it's not, we're not trying to kick girls off, but we're actually trying to have like these, you know, conversations with, with women at the table and so it's oh, almost cool. a round table kind of thing um but uh it's it's been it's really been taken off it's a great it's a great show it's something that i've been sort of uh, trying to develop with uh, mike once i met mike back in august awesome um and so i've got that going on and he's very uh, cool i just met him he's just here we'll be on adam sosnick's show tomorrow oh awesome at 4 mm -hmm. okay cool mm -hmm. so you're gonna cause more trouble over there yes we will. everyone in the audience hit that like button hit that subscribe button that's how you show me love i told you i get to 100k i'm gonna do something special it's mm -hmm. not gonna involve a disco ball i've weeded that out you're but not 100k a, i thought you were no 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 adam's we're at 100 no, That's we're right. into not. We're we're brand, we're not even six months, but we're doing really well. I'm really excited, and I love my audience, mm -hmm. um, and they love me. Hopefully, I don't know. We'll see. Bye, guys. I'll see you on what's today? Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I'll Wednesday. see you on Friday. I'll be solo, and I've got some videos that are gonna make you. You'll be in between love and hate. Let's just say that. You'll see laugh. You you'll cry. You'll, <laughs> there you ten, go. you'll kiss ten bucks goodbye. <laughs> exactly. Bye, everyone. <laughs>